get started here. I hit pause earlier and forgot to hit record again or resume. Okay, with that, Ed, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you go for it here. Oh, I am not sharing my screen and I thought I was this whole time. Oh, no, I am. Okay. You are. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I'll just start off by a quick introduction as we do the uh, switch in sharing screens. Hi, everybody. My name is Ed Keith. Um, I work for Deschutes County as well uh, as the county forester. Um, and in that role, uh, I work with um, communities on wildfire preparedness and fuel reduction projects and uh, work right alongside Boone on uh, Firewise Communities efforts, uh, as well as uh, participation in um, the Deschutes Collaborative Forest Project that works uh, with a whole host of community members to try to advance uh, forest management on the Deschutes National Forest, um, as well as uh, a few other efforts. So um, glad to be here today. Uh, I'm going to start us off on our uh, our second bubble here, which is the, the fire context. Um, and I'll just acknowledge before I dive into this, that this could potentially be uh, a full day class on Central Oregon fire ecology. And we're gonna cover it in just a few minutes here, uh, just to add a little bit of context to why some of the principles we'll be talking about today are, are important, uh, but we won't really be diving in, uh, taking a deep dive into all the science around um, fire, fire ecology, fire occurrence, fire risk, those sorts of things. But we, we did want to touch on that to give you a little bit of context. So with that, we're going to dive right into it um, and to start off with um, somewhat of a uh, bold statement and say that um, fire is, is really uh, here to stay in Central Oregon. Uh, it's been part of the landscape for millennia and uh, and it's um, you know it's fire frequency has changed as we'll as we'll dive into but um, fire is not going away in central Oregon and, and that's one of the things we really um, want you to take in is that uh, we don't really have a no fire option here um, our ecosystems and our, our weather our fuels uh, are just adapted to fire um, and so really our choices we have are what kind of fire we're going to have on the landscape and then how is that fire going to affect our communities. Um, so just a little historical context for people that may not have been around Central Oregon for very long uh, about uh, if you come to Central Oregon today and see what our forests are like, they're, they're not necessarily representative of what we might have found in the past. Uh, and this photo uh, series that I'm going to show you uh, is meant to illustrate that. Um, so uh, this, is a, this is a photo series taken in the same spot. Uh, there's more photos to it, but just I, I think these three really illustrate uh, the point we're trying to make is that uh, about the time that European settle, settlers uh, arrived in the Central Oregon area, they arrived to a forest that was really looking uh, at least in our, our Ponderosa Pine areas, uh, something like this. Um, stands that were stands of trees that were fairly open in nature uh, with not very many small trees in the understory, uh, fairly, uh, the, the understory really consisted of, you know, small brush and, and grass um, with lots of spaces in between the trees. And also you'll notice that the canopy of the trees is well off the ground and that was due to the fact that uh, these ecosystems uh, before European settlement really experienced fire on a pretty regular basis. Uh, and because fire uh, happened on a pretty regular basis, um, it burned at a fairly low intensity. So if you can imagine a fire that would happen in a, in a place like this right now, there's really not a lot of fuel on the forest floor and that fire would probably burn at a pretty low intensity. There might be a few seedlings that we're not seeing out there. Those would likely be cleared out by the fire. Uh, the grasses and brush would be burned, but the, the large trees with the thick bark would likely survive the fire. Most of them would, uh, if not all of them. Um, and uh, and then, you know, in, in another year, this, this forest 
floor would green up and uh, it would uh, look about the same as it did the year before with the fire having really very little effect on the, the overstory trees. Uh, going from 1909 to 1948, again, that tree here is uh, still here, um, but we started a period of what we'd call fire exclusion. So uh, with settlement came the idea that we needed to suppress all fires, that fires were bad, and that they were a threat to the timber resource, the grazing resource, and uh, and the, the, um, the communities that were being built. And so uh, you can see the result of that uh, after missing a few of those fire cycles that would have happened at a relatively low intensity. Uh, the trees that have come in in the understory now are starting to uh, really fill in that understory. Uh, still a fair amount of, of grass and, and a few openings here or there, um, but this, the small trees are really uh, filled in under the larger tree canopies to the point where if a fire would happen um, in this setting, you might expect it to burn a little bit more uh, intensely and, and uh, some of the smaller trees might uh, act as what we call ladder fuel to carry fire up into the, uh, the larger trees. And then of course if we move to 1989, uh, we really can't see that larger tree in the background much, uh, but we, we still see that there's a couple out there. Uh, and that this understory has filled in with a thicket of very small uh, trees and they're, they're pretty well what, what I call continuous uh, fuels or uh, continuous understory of, of trees. And it's continuous both uh, vertically and horizontally where if I look across the, the, the width of the picture, there's really not a break uh, in the trees. And also if I look from top to bottom, there's really not a break in the trees. Um, I also notice that in this picture, there's actually a, a, another species that would probably not have tolerated fire at all uh, with some fur here in the foreground. Um, and so we're, we're not only seeing uh, a shift in the composition of the forest, but we're actually seeing a shift in the, the, the species as well. And uh, I, I'll let you use your imagination of what might happen if a fire came through this, uh, this setting, uh, but I, I, would, I would guess that um, it would probably burn a little bit more intensely than the, the first picture that we saw. Uh, and a lot of the larger trees would probably be uh, killed because the smaller trees would lead that fire up into the canopy of the larger trees. Um, so just a little example of uh, how our forests have evolved over a period of about 100, 120 years of fire exclusion. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that um, it wasn't just uh, our, our you know, before, he, before European settlements, uh, in, in Central Oregon, there was, you know, other humans here, Native Americans used fire as a tool. So it wasn't just the lightning that started the fire, but it was actually Native Americans that were uh, using fire as a tool um, across the landscape and, and, you know, protecting the places that they lived and managing the wildlife habitat and, and the forest to, through their primary tool, which was fire. Um, I recently was doing some research on uh, how much uh, acreage was burned in the past and I found an interesting study in California that um, on, on the low end they were estimating that at least four million acres just in California were were burned each year and that uh, last year was a record setting year uh, as far as um, modern um, history goes in our modern history and that was about four million acres so as much as we're thinking that um, there's a lot of fire on the landscape right now. Um, th there was historically quite a bit of fire on, on this landscape and we know that based on a lot of scientific research uh, examining um, cross-section of trees that can detect when fires occurred and really piecing together that we did have um, fire, a lot of fire on the landscape uh, across all our dry western forests. So to illustrate that and to kind of piece this uh, re body of research that's occurred over several decades, uh, th this graph is meant to kind of sum that up. And let's see if it, no, it does not zoom in. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on it. Uh, so you can hopefully see a few details, but um, it's interesting here in Central Oregon that there's such a uh, gradient of moisture and that gradient of moisture that uh, if you start at the
tip of the Cascades with uh, annual precipitation over 140 inches per year on average. Moving out to uh, the juniper woodlands in just a period of, of 25 to 30 miles, uh, that moisture drops off to um, 10 inches or, or less. And that really results in a variety of, of ecosystems in a very short distance uh, coming down from the Cascades and moving out into the high desert. Um, but really across all those ecosystems, uh, fire did play a role in the past in shaping those ecosystems. Uh, and the difference between those was really the amount of, uh, of, fi of fire or the frequency of fire, how often it occurred. Uh, and then of course, along with that, how severely it burned, uh, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, or like I said, we're not gonna really dive into this too deep uh, this morning, but just as a few examples, uh, I'd point out just because a lot of our communities are located in the, the ponderosa pine um, type, uh, forest type, um, just as a way to, to read this graph. So, um, you know, somewhere between 15 and, and 30 inches, we see primarily dry ponderosa pine. Um, and that, um, that forest type experience, like I was saying earlier, uh, fairly short fire return interval, somewhere between five and 25 years on average. So, um, so because of that fire uh, visited ponderosa pine pretty frequently, it did burn at a fairly low intensity and that resulted in those large fire resistant uh, trees with the thick bark and the high canopies um, spread out from um, most of the, the foothills of the Cascades here on the east side of the Cascades. Uh, if you move up a little bit uh, in elevation to our uh, mixed conifer types, they, they move from dry to moist to wet, and the, the species kind of vary, uh, the species composition varies a, a, a bit based on that moisture. Um, our fire um, frequency starts to move from short to intermediate, but still quite a bit of fire in those uh, mixed conifer types. Uh, because it was uh, a little bit longer in duration, slightly longer, but not a lot longer than ponderosa pine, um, it did burn at what we would call a mixed severity um, uh, as far as the fire severity goes. And so, uh, you know, there'd be places where fire burned at a low intensity, but then it would maybe take out a patch of trees here or there, um, but it didn't burn across tens of thousands of acres and taking out all the trees um, in, in those settings. It was really kind of more... Uh, patchy in nature um, with a mixed severity. As you move up into the higher elevations, um, you can imagine that uh, snow persists in those areas for a longer period of time. The fire seasons are shorter. It's moister up there, cool at night. Um, those ecosystems uh, really have a, a, a ex only experience fire on a, on a more limited basis. So those could go uh, upwards of, you know, one to 200 years or more. Um, but when they do burn, uh, they would typically be burning under extreme conditions. And, and since they had um, grown for so long, the, the fuel that it accumulated over those um, decades or centuries uh, would result in a fire that burned at a higher severity. So you can think of fires like on the Santa Ann Pass um, as emblematic of a, of a a fire regime that burns it at, at a higher intensity, but at a lower frequency. And then of course, East of Bend um, um, and the Redmond area, that those sorts of things uh, are our juniper woodlands. Um, and uh, because those are so dry, uh, they're limited in productivity. So they, they saw more of a, they didn't see as much fire frequency as we saw in like our, our most fire frequent ecosystem, which is Ponderosa pine, really more, um, uh, again, akin to the, the, the mixed conifer and intermediate fire frequency where it might have seen fire every 35 to 70 years. Um, those ecosystems are now seeing actually more fire uh, due to um, a variety of factors, but um, the one I'd point my finger at would be the invasive annual grasses that we see uh, now in our, in our juniper woodland and sage types that really carry fire through those ecosystems because the, 
those fine fuels are, are dry for a long period of time and they really create a continuous fuel bed for those fires to carry across. So uh, we're seeing more fire in those ecosystems that, than uh, we used to in the past as opposed to some of our other forest types that are seeing less fire uh, than we used to in the past. But anyway, the take home uh, for you all today is that uh, across all of our ecosystems in Central Oregon, and even the one that's not um, depicted on this particular graphic, lodgepole pine, all those ecosystems really evolved under uh, some sort of uh, fire, whether it's a short to a, a intermediate to long uh, return interval, they all did experience fire in the past. Uh, and they've, they, the, the, uh, the wildlife and the plants that occur in those forests really have uh, evolved to live with fire. Okay, moving on uh, to our uh, fire history map. Um, so in more recent history, uh, this, this uh, map depicts fires that go back um, basically as far as we have records for the early 1900s. Uh, we do have some record of fire. Um, more recently, from 1960 on, we have a pretty accurate uh, record of fires uh, across the West. And I would say that uh, even though I'm just showing Deschutes County, you could extrapolate what we see in Deschutes County across most of the Intermountain West, really, as far as um, the amount of fire frequency, seeing larger fires, seeing more acres burned. Uh, that's a trend that you see um, play out here in Deschutes County, but uh, I could probably pick a lot of counties or even states and, and, and come to the same conclusion. But for today, um, just to make it a little bit more local, we're gonna show you a map of Deschutes County and the fire history here. So just a little bit about this uh, graphic as I zoom in so you can see it a little better. This map um, is available on our website. Uh, if you want a higher resolution version of it, we can give you a link to it. But um, uh, this map shows all, fire, all large fires, fires over 100 acres uh, that have occurred in Deschutes County that are in the historical record up through last fire season. Um, and it's color graded so that uh, the fires that occurred early in the 1900s are darker green, uh, the mid uh, 1900s in lighter green, um, the late 1900s and then moving into the, the first decades of the 2000s uh, in uh, more of an orange to a, a red color um, it also shows fire starts, so all those little black dots scattered across the map are, are uh, fire detections. Those do not go back to 1900 because all we'd have was a black map, but those are a 10-year history of uh, fire occurrence um, in Deschutes County uh, across the different jurisdictions uh, for the data we have available. Uh, and of course, then it uh, shows the, the acreage by decade. Um, here, but uh, so a couple couple take homes um, from this map. Um, one is that um, right around the European settlement time for Central Oregon in the early 1900s, you do see uh, a few large fires on the landscapes. Um, so fires were occurring, uh, and then um, in the decade of 1910, we had what, what was called the big blow up, and and that really changed fire policy in the U.S. to um, um, what what I would, uh, well, there was a policy that uh, came along, it was called the 10 a.m. policy. And the policy was that each fire that was detected was uh, expected to be put out by 10 o'clock the next morning. If it wasn't put out 10 o'clock that morning, it would be expected to be put out 10 o'clock the next morning. So very, expect to be very aggressive um, initial attack and very aggressive fire suppression to exclude all fire from the landscape uh, because fire was thought to be uh, just play a bad role, uh, not just for human, uh, but 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 um, but for just the ecosystems in general. And so we uh, saw a huge drop off in uh, acres burned after the decade of 1910, um, up until the point where um, fuels had been really built up. Uh, and we couldn't be quite as successful in excluding fires from our landscape anymore uh, in the late 1900s. Um, and so again, you start to see this play out in um, the larger um, fires on the landscape that were starting to occur um, in the 1990s, but uh, well into the 
2000s and, and the 2010s as well. Um, so uh, we're seeing uh, now larger fires. Uh, the thing that I would say is that we're, we're not seeing these fires burn at what we would have expected to normally uh, burn at a low intensity. We're seeing these burn at, at, a, at a higher intensity across a larger um, amount of acreage uh, on any given fire. Um, another take home from this is that we are, uh, as much as there are, there is fire on the landscape, um, you look at those, the, the record of starts over the 10 years, we are very successful at still putting out fires. Um, and uh, that needs to be a strategy with the amount of people that live on the landscape that we, we do continue to suppress fires um, especially near communities where these fires could um, impact our, our communities and our infrastructure. Uh, we're, we are successful at putting out about 98% of fires uh, before they reach that 100 uh, acre threshold that would put them on this map. So a lot of fires occurring on the landscape that you all probably don't really even hear about. Um, and those are both lightning cause, but also human cause, as you can probably guess by say, looking at where our, our humans are concentrated in Deschutes County around Bend, uh, you can see quite a um, clustering of uh, fire causes south of Bend, west of Bend, and even right in the city of Bend. There's quite a few uh, fires clustered there and most of those are human cause. So, um, so we are still successful and we will continue to, to um, suppress fires, uh, but just saying that there's been a change in the way that these fires burn as far as the, the acreage and the intensity that they burn at uh, now due, due to a variety of reasons, not just fire exclusion, but um, a warming climate and um, a change, changes in, in, in forest management and in grazing and, and a whole host of other things, again, that we probably don't have time to get into uh, today. But anyway, just saying that we still experience fire in the landscape in Deschutes County, and we will, we will continue to suppress fires as much as possible, but the, the, the trend um, I believe uh, if we were to add on the decade of, of 2020 and I'll just um, zoom into this graph here, uh, if we were to add another bar graph in the 2020s, I'm, I'm going to predict that uh, that bar graph isn't going to be any shorter than the acres we saw burned in the 2010s. Um, it's going to take us a while to, um, as we are working on reducing fuels around our communities and out in the forest, uh, to really catch up on a backlog of growth that's happened over the last century um, with uh, the knowledge that we know today that we really need to prepare our forest for fires to burn at a lower intensity and to prepare our communities um, for that fire reality as well. Um, so basically that leads us to uh, this conclusion, which is that uh, even though we are successful at putting out 98% of the fires before they reach that 100 acre threshold, uh, that what that means to us and what we're seeing and how that's playing out is that uh, when we're, we now then uh, experience large fires at the times where we cannot put them out uh, and they, we cannot put them out for a variety of reasons, but um, it usually has to do what I would um, suggest would be three main reasons and those are uh, we have an extreme weather event. Uh, it, it, you can only think back to the Labor Day fires and the extreme winds that we experienced during those times. Uh, uh, really low humidity, really high winds. Um, those are the times that we're seeing fires that we just, there's, there's not enough resources um, it, it, it really uh, that exist. Um, to get in front of a fire when when we have you know sustained gusts of 40 to 70 miles an hour winds and in heavy fuels so uh, so weather um, is playing a role in the um, fire start where we just really can't um, safely or effectively suppress those fires and, and th that's when a lot of our acres um, burned occur um, this the second factor is uh, they're occurring in areas where we haven't been able to uh, reduce the fuels to the point where uh, fires would burn at a lower intensity, even under um, uh, 
you know, a, a more extreme weather event. And then the final one is that um, I suggested this already, but there uh, we only have so many resources to go around. And usually during those extreme events, we have a, a, a you know, kind of the, the trifecta, they, they occur uh, maybe in places that are tough to suppress, then we get a weather event, but also we have resources that are stretched too thin over um, a wide geographic area. And, and we, we do have times where we actually run out of firefighters um, to call. Um, and so, um, so, so those, those come together to really pr uh, produce a, a, a bit of a conundrum for us where um, the fires that we have on the landscape now that really make the nightly news are the ones that are the most extreme. They're the ones that kill people, burn down homes or communities. Um, and that's kind of the reality we're seeing play out today. And that's not all to be doom and gloom. That's to say that um, we, we just want you to realize that um, this is our, our current fire reality. It doesn't have to be our fire reality uh, into the future. Um, and some of the things we're going to cover in our class today will hopefully, um, um, you know, inform what we can do as community members and what you can do as community members to better prepare your homes and, and whole communities for um, for living in this this fire adapted uh, environment, and so that we can have better fire outcomes. Where we can have a hopefully, my fire future is that we have fire on the landscape. Um, but we don't have to worry about people getting killed or homes being lost because we've prepared our communities and we've prepared our, our, our forests and other wildlands um, to burn under conditions that aren't going to produce bad outcomes. And so uh, we really think that um, some of the tools that we'll be talking about today as far as defensible space and appropriate um, building practices will lead to that uh, better fire future. And so um, uh, that would conclude my section as far as adding a little bit of context to um, the environment that we live in in Central Oregon and that fire is here to stay, but that we can hopefully live with it. So with that, I will turn it back to, I guess I'll turn it right over to Ariel who has the next section. So. Great, thank you, Ed. Um, I'm just going to share my screen right now. All right, hopefully you all can see that. You got the, are you able to see the screen? Yep, we got you. Great, thanks. Uh, so yep, yeah, good morning everyone. My name is Ariel Cowan. I work for Oregon State University Extension um, here in Central Oregon. And um, I'm part of a new fire program as a regional fire specialist for the area. And uh, Ed gave a, a great introduction to uh, what fire and fire history is like for Central Oregon. Um, and so now we're going to talk a little bit more about the wildland urban interface and what um, that really means for our wildfire home protection strategies. And at any point, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, yeah, so. Uh, maybe many of you have heard of this term, the wildland urban interface. And so what is this? What does this term mean? And, and often it's abbre abbreviated as WUI. So you might have heard of the WUI, um, but you know, what is it? Is it a specific location? Maybe you've seen a zone on a map, um, but it really is more of the definition of uh, a location where a wildfire can spread from vegetation to structures. And uh, you know, we work with a lot of folks who live in a variety of settings, but uh, in general, um, with all these different settings, it's still uh, the WUI would be where uh, homes and communities can ignite and burn, um, you know, whether or not there is a wildfire um, right next to them. And so uh, <laughs> I, I really want, uh, to take the opportunity to ask all of you uh, if um, you think that your home or your property is within the WUI. So I wonder, Boone, if we can pull up that, that poll. 
So I'm just going to give a couple of moments for folks to answer this question of whether you think that you live in the WUI or the wildland urban interface. All right, great. We've got about 75% of everyone here has responded. Oh, 83. Great. Um, so can folks see the responses? Here, oh, we got sharing of the results. Great. So uh, really interesting. Um, a lot of folks have um, considered themselves as living within the wildland urban interface. Um, uh, we've got maybe one person who does not think that they live in the wildland urban interface, but um, I would say, yeah, a lot of people are right that um, we would consider uh, all around the county and central Oregon to be the wildland urban interface because we live in a fire environment, just like how Ed was describing how fire has been here for a very long time. And so, uh, you know, there's uh, the the misconception of that the wildland urban interface and, and your home or property being at risk to wildfire is only if you're right next to federal land, for example. And that's not necessarily true um, because there we live in such a fire environment. Um, we all here in Central Oregon live within the wildland urban interface. So that was great. Thank you for responding to that poll. So now I will continue. And uh, next slide, um, as I was saying, uh, Wui is uh, not necessarily a geographic location, but it is a set of conditions uh, where a home can ignite from, from fire. And so there's this whole continuum of what the Wui looks like. Um, maybe more generally, you would think of these wildland areas, a home being here, or more rural homes, um, but really, uh, you know, even from suburban to urban areas, uh, there can be, um, uh, you know, in the case of Central Oregon, that you could be living within the WUI. And so, before I jump into the next set of photos, um, I really just uh, want to um, give a heads up that we will be seeing some photos of homes that have burned. And um, just as a warning, if that's triggering for anyone, uh, if you've been evacuated before or have had your home burned, um, but we, we want to still share these photos uh, for the purpose of being able to identify um, what happened in, in those situations and how we can learn from those situations uh, to protect our homes. So this photo is from the car fire near Redding in California. And uh, it's possible a lot of the folks in this uh, neighborhood did not consider themselves as living within the Wui. And so they were within a mile of the Sacramento River and a mile of I-5. Um, so, you know, perhaps they thought, okay, they're far enough away from a, uh, a wildland area or close enough to an urban area that um, a fire could not burn through their neighborhood, but that was not necessarily the case. Um, so you see here how uh, this became, the fire became destructive for many parts of the neighborhood. And here is the same fire, um, but this photo is just a bit more zoomed out um, to give you more perspective. And uh, you know, there's just a lot of vegetation, a lot of trees throughout the neighborhood and uh, homes that are, you know, some of them are more close together than others. And um, th this fire was still a big threat um, for this neighborhood, even though actually in this photo, they were within a half mile of I-5 and the river. So this next photo, um, uh, rough to look at, you know, all these 
homes burned next to a golf course, but I really wanted to bring up this uh, point that uh, for those who live near a golf course or a well-irrigated park, um, that, that does not necessarily mean that you're not at risk. Um, you know, it would be good to consider uh, all the different sides around your property, around your home, um, if the homes are close together and what kind of vegetation is close to the home. Um, because, uh, you know, just because you're, you have a golf course or a park uh, on one side of your home does not mean that you're not at risk. And so I, I also want to um, uh, point out that the Wui problem is, it's not just a, a fire problem, um, or it's not just a Wui problem, but it's actually more of a structure ignition problem. Um, and, and a social problem as more homes are being built and it becomes more desirable to live in a flammable landscape. And so, um, you know, it, we can mitigate the risk of wildfire impacts um, to homes by reducing a home's ignition potential um, in extreme wildfire conditions. And that can be done without necessarily controlling the wildfire, um, but actually each of us individually can be working on um, the different elements um, uh, around our home in order to, to prevent structure ignition. So I really want to dispel the myth of the Miracle House. Sometimes I hear um, about, oh, the one home that's left standing you know, uh, they talk about it in the news after a fire. And uh, in this case, we've got a couple of homes that were left standing in this photo. Um, but it's, uh, you know, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't want us to buy into the notion um, that it's just because of a miracle, um, but it's really more that there's a small measure of luck, um, but really reducing the home's ignition potential through uh, what building materials are used um, and defensible space uh, gives a home up to an 80% chance of survival uh, with without any intervention from fire resources, firefighting resources. Um, so, you know, this photo is actually another example in California, but um, really I'd want you to focus on the vegetation and around the homes. And uh, you know, did these homes have space between them and, and that vegetation or, or you know, between uh, another home next to it that maybe had flammable materials used um, around the home? And it's likely that the homes that burned did actually have um, some of those uh, issues um, with the building materials or the vegetation next to the home. So, uh, now I'm going to go into a little bit more of the types of fire that we could, or the types of the, of the ways that uh, a home could ignite. Um, and so a surface fire is a type of fire where uh, the fire spreads uh, along the ground uh, from the vegetation that's on the ground. You know, it could be shrubs or grass, um, and it could be uh, you know, ornamental uh, landscaping plants that you have. Um, and so if we see uh, uh, in the bottom part of this picture, um, how the fire had spread. Um, and uh, this shows that it's not necessarily a wall of flames that created uh, this situation, um, but it was that you know, if the fire reached uh, a part of the house, part of you know, could have been a, a deck or a fence around the home. That that, if that was directly connected to the home, that that could have led to that home burning. Um, but I really want to point out how many homes actually burn from uh, embers. Most homes ignite from embers. Um, and another way would be from structure to structure ignition. And in most of the extreme fires, much of the vegetation around the home is consumed or singed um, on the sides closest to the home. But uh, if you notice, it's interesting how uh, there's some of these trees that have not been burnt, um, but that kind of gives me the, the idea that 
really the fire had leapt from one home to the next in this situation. And in terms of embers, uh, you know, sometimes there can be uh, the main part of the fire that's further away and there's a, you know, a, a large wind that's pushing this fire, but that wind can also pick up uh, embers or firebrands and they can be sent further out beyond the main part of the fire. And if those embers ending, end up landing on your roof and you've got maybe accumulation of pine needles on your roof or something like that, or maybe your roof is made of very highly flammable materials like cedar shake, um, then that is uh, another way that then your home is at risk of igniting. And we're gonna go over a lot more of, of ways that you can um, prevent that or uh, pr protect from that a bit more. So how do these fires turn into a disaster, a really disaster? Um, so a greater number of conditions that set up for, um, for uh, a, a situation where many homes are burning is, you know, it creates a greater likelihood of a wooly disaster. And so just going through a lot of this, uh, this timeline here, uh, if we think about if we start with severe fire conditions, uh, you know, like whether it be through 80 degree days, um, really strong winds, and uh, you know, a situation where we're in a drought where it's very dry conditions, that just really sets the stage for the disaster. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that would happen. You would really need for the next in the timeline to occur, which would be um, that wildfires start, uh, which you know, we're not gonna go over uh, how to prevent that in this workshop, but you know, whether it's um, uh, started by people or started by lightning. And then from there, if we end up with multiple simultaneous ignitions, then uh, it, within an urban area, um, then that becomes a, a particularly difficult issue for uh, our firefighting resources. And so we have 13 fire districts around the county and uh, some of these mutual aid partners have to drive uh, over an hour just to get to uh, a, you know, a different spot where there might be a fire. And so if there's multiple fires going on, uh, as Ed was talking about earlier, um, then resources can be overwhelmed and they cannot cover the exposure. So if that occurs, then we end up having, unfortunately, uh, either reduced protection or no fire protection for some of these homes. And so many homes would ignite and burn um, without um, there being a resource right there to do something about it. Um, so it's really a, a, a time factor of, uh, you know, uh, resources cannot get there quick enough. And we have many of these homes igniting, then that's eventually that, that, um, a wooly disaster where multiple homes are destroyed. Uh, so going through, the reason why I go through this timeline is because we can identify where we can put a stop to this timeline um, where all of us um, can really make a difference. And so, Really, it's urban fires, um, this multiple simultaneous ignitions. Uh, if we can do um, what we can around our properties in terms of defensible space and uh, structure materials, uh, then we can potentially reduce the number of simultaneous ignitions. So, you know, if homes, I know it sounds silly, but um, <laughs> it may sound obvious, but if homes don't ignite, then they don't burn. Um, so preventing those homes from igniting in the first place, then that can make a big difference. So, you know, I wanna reframe our approach, which is really what we're going over today in this workshop, um, that if we really focus on uh, preventing or working to um, stop these home ignitions by doing things around our property, um, then that can make uh, 
this effort a lot more attainable in bite-sized chunks, you know, to tackle this, this whole um, issue instead of feeling helpless. So, uh, you know, I just want to check in if there's any questions about the wildland urban interface, interface um, or anything that I covered. Any questions from folks? We don't have any um, questions directly related to your section this time. We've got one that we'll capture at the end here. I'm referring sure. to, um, here I'll turn on my video as well, referring to um, the rangeland and uh, some of the effects of fire suppression out there, but we can come back to that towards the end. Um, thank you, Ariel. Um, I'm going to jump in next here. Let me see here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I believe that should be sharing. Okay, so I'm going to um, I'm going to jump into fire science. So all these kind of overlap and tie together. So you may end up hearing me say a couple things that Ariel or Ed had already uh, mentioned, but you know all these things tie together so much that we we can't really separate them. So hold on one second here. I want to change one of my screens. There we go. Go back down. Okay, so what we have here in front of us, so thinking about fire science, um, we have these two triangles and, and many folks are familiar with at least the, the top triangle of the two. And um, the top tri triangle is just the general fire triangle that we all learn at school, you know, when Smokey Bear comes by or whatever, but it's the heat, oxygen, and fuel. We can't have combustion without those three things. And that's, that's the triangle of what's required just to have a flame or to have fire. And then this bottom one is our fire behavior triangle. So how that fire is going to um, behave. So how intense it's going to burn, how tall the flame lengths are, or how fast it's spreading through the um, through the through the landscape, and, and that triangle is made up of our weather, topography, and our fuel. Right, and topography is the terrain features. So thinking about whether it's a steep slope or not, and weather, of course, is our daily weather that we're all familiar with. How hot it is, how dry it is, and then the one thing that we see that's common between these two triangles is the fuel. So if you were to remove fuel from that top triangle, we wouldn't have fire, right? But that's, that's not really a reality. We're not going to be going out and trying to remove all fuel around all of our homes because after all, if you really break it down to its simplest form, our, our home is also a fuel. So we're not, we're not really going to get rid of that um, fuel around our home so much that we'd be asking for a moonscape around houses or anything. But, what, but we can alter the fuel, like thinking about it in that lower triangle, as it pertains to the fire behavior on the landscape is how is that fire going to behave out there? How is it going to act? Is it going to be intense? Do they have low flame lengths or big flame lengths? And that's the piece that we, we have the control over. The ways that fuel impact, let me make sure I get this right. There we go. Oh, come on. There we go. So, um, Heat. So how's that heat transferred? How's that, you know, we're going to go down the road of how fire transfers and moves through the landscape, but we also want to think about how heat is being transferred out there as well, um, because that directly relates to the fire behavior. So convection, this is uh, one of the ways that we're transferring our heat, and that's through a lot of, maybe I should back this up just one step. We, we think about heat quite a bit when it pertains to our fuels, because the heat is helping to make those fuels available to burn. So if you had moist fuels out there, they wouldn't be available to burn until they get to a point that there's enough moisture driven off of them or gone from them that they ignite. So we want to think about how that heat is being transferred out there on the landscape, how it's transferring to our homes and the surrounding area around our homes. So convection is one of the ways that we're transferring that heat, driving the moisture off of the fuels or off of our house and making it available to burn. And convection is, is gas or air that's moving by. So when you think about a wildland fire, that's all that smoke that's coming off of a fire. It's being blasted through a house or through the vegetation or through limbs in the tree. And it's, and it's heating all that stuff up and releasing the heat off of those fuels and making them more available to burn. Uh, radiation is 
you know, you can think of it in two different ways. Um, radiation can be the heat that we feel from the sun. That's, you know, that's radiant heat that we feel from the sun every day. And then the other one would be radiant heat that we feel from our campfires that we stand around. And the same thing in the wildland, if there's flames next to, um, you know, if there's flames next to some other fuel particle, whether it's a log or a house or a um, shed or something, it's radiant heat can also be warming that fuel up. And then the last one is conduction, so direct contact. And the, the image here shows, you know, a metal rod, and that's pretty obvious that that would cause ignition or cause it to get hot from one end to the other and transfer the heat directly through that solid material. But in the wildland, instead of a metal rod, it's more uh, in terms of something like a, um, like a log or a stick that's laying on the landscape. So that's how we're transferring our heat around and, and making our fuels more available to burn. Um, so how do fires spread? So generally speaking, we think of fires spreading in three different ways. A ground fire, so something that's moving through the fuels that are immediately like on the ground, on or in the ground, if you will, or surface fire, so something that's moving through the surface or something that's moving through the canopy. So ground fires, in this, this picture, I, when it zooms in, it's a little pixelated, but what we're looking at are a bunch of pine needles on the ground. So the ground fire is generally pretty low intensity as far as flame lengths. And the rates of spread are usually pretty slow or yeah, pretty slow as well. So when I think of a ground fire, you know, the things that I think about when it, around residents are things like needle beds. So a large needle bed or uh, bark mulch or wood chips, something like that, where it's, it's ignitable, it can burn, it's not gonna be an intense fire. But it also means it's probably a fire that we probably won't even notice either. And we'll talk about defensible space and bark mulch and stuff later in the class. But these are um, low intensity fires that sometimes can go unnoticed, but they burn very slowly. They put off minimal flames. So if you think about the pine needles that are covering your property or, or whatever, it's going to be low flames that they create that, um, that move across there compared to something like a surface fire. And surface fires. Um, burn in the surface fuels, which are kind of uh, basically surface fuels are defined as zero to six feet off of the ground. So this would be any kind of vegetation that might be in that kind of space. So things like brush, lower limbs on trees, um, dead, dead logs or limbs that have fallen from trees. And then the fire behavior that we see from this is a little more intense, right, or it can be at least depending on how much fuel is in there, like what is the loading? Is it full of a bunch of logs and limbs plus brush or, or is it just brush or just logs? Um, surface fuels or surface fires are generally one of our more active fires. We get some pretty tall flame lengths out of it depending on what that fuel is and the intensity, like I said, can be pretty high with the fuel loading as well. Hey Boone. Yep. Uh, sorry, this is it. Uh, I just uh, got a quick message saying that at least one person is not seeing your screen. So I just want to check in to see if that's a, I, I'm seeing your screen. Um, but I just wanted to pause real quick to see if we could resolve that. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, sharing on my side, perhaps. Um, yeah, anybody I see, else? I can see canopy fire. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Maybe so it's probably for that a, person, they can either log out and log back in or... Yeah, I would suggest that. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think it's just local to that uh, one machine. Maybe Frank, you can try to log back in if uh, it hasn't been resolved. Yeah, and you might even try, um, you know, depending on what you're doing on your computer, you may have opened something else and you can't see the Zoom anymore. <laughs> yeah, near the bottom of your um, computer, you should, near your, your taskbar, there should be the little blue icon for Zoom. If you're using the Zoom app, click on that again and it might pop it back up for you. Or, um, or if you're using the application, it could be through your web browser. It might open up your web browser again and see if it's there. And if that doesn't work, then I would log out and log back in. 
I think that's what you can do. So you can proceed. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a more widespread issue. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. And the third um, way that fire spreads through the landscape is our canopy fires, right? This is the this is the stuff that's sensationalized that's, that we see on TV and through the movies and the um, you know even the media. And it, and it does happen, and it happens under those extreme conditions like we saw last year, and where we have alignment with, um, basically with those three pieces of that triangle earlier, where we have the alignment with weather that permits this to happen, the topography that allows it or encourages it. So oftentimes on steep slopes or, or in places that are exposed to wind to allow it to be pushed through the canopy. And then the last part is the fuel that we have, fuel that allows it to transition to the canopy. And I, I think there's a kind of a key piece that I like to add in when we think about canopy fires. Um, there's three things that have to happen, or at least three factors that go into the transition to crown or transition to uh, from the ground to the crown. So if we have a ground fire, and for it to transition into the crown, we need to have surface fuel intensity. So we have to have lots of fuel loading below the trees. Canopy base height needs to be low. So the, the bottom of the canopy of where those limbs come down the tree need to be close to the ground. And then the third one is canopy bulk density, which in other terms means we have to have enough, enough material in a cubic area of space above the ground to transmit flames between those. So we have to have canopies close to one another um, for it to transmit, for it to move through. So, so those three things. So summarizing that, intense fires, lots of fuel on the ground. We have to have um, canopy base height, so we have to have low limbs to the ground. And then the third thing is we have to have tree spacing tight enough for it to, to be up there, right? And the, for it to sustain in, in the canopy, we also need to have, uh, we need to continually have, for the most part, surface fire intensity to hold the heat up there to keep it moving. Um, and that, you know, so keeping that stuff in mind when we're thinking about it around our house, we really want to make sure we're thinking about those things, especially the, the surface fire intensity, are we removing the brush? And then the um, canopy base height, are we looking at our ladder fuels and making sure that we're taking care of those? Okay, so how do homes ignite? That's kind of the next piece here. Oops. That did not advance for me. There we go. So how do homes, how do homes ignite? So the majority of the homes, right, ignite from uh, one of two ways. It's flames and embers. And Ariel hit on this earlier, talking about embers. But the one thing, you know, and I, I would normally in the classroom, I'd put this poll out to the classroom just to see what people thought. But, you know, when we think back to the slide we are just on, the piece that's missing off of here is the is the canopy fires right? Those massive canopy fires are not are not generally the source of our ignition, right? It's going to be one of two things. We got flames that are directly impinging on the house, so we've got some kind of vegetation or a deck or a fence or something like that that's right next to the house, creating flames right there on the house, putting heat underneath the eaves or something that ignite the home, or it's embers from a fire that's burning somewhere else. We've got an ember storm that's blowing embers onto our house. And it's landing on some kind of receptive fuel bed, kind of like what we saw with the ground fuels earlier. It's landing into needles on the roof or in the gutter or that are next to the foundation or deck or you know, the list goes on or some kind of bark mulch has been put into landscaping up against the home. So those are the two ways that we think about the home igniting. And embers by far are the number one cause of home ignition. And that, you know, and I'm, and I'm not making that stuff up, right? It's like we've got 30 years of research that shows us that um, Basically, what we do in the last 100 foot around our home has a greater impact on our home survivability than what happens beyond that 100 foot. So lots of research goes into home ignition from embers. This video here we're going to watch is from the um, Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. And this, they've got somewhat of an um, interesting job here where they set up these homes in a giant hangar basically, but they, um, they build it out of different materials and then they, they blow a bunch of embers at it and uh, replicate some kind of an ember storm and then view the ways in which different materials resist ignition or are susceptible to ignition. So they try to set this up in ways that really look 
and feel similar to the ways or the conditions that we may have around our own homes. So it's a, about a four minute video here. It looks fairly typical, right? Lots of uh, bark molts around our homes. A few little plantings of vegetation, not too far from the foundation generally. And here are their <clears throat> wind generators blowing the embers towards the house. This can be quite realistic, right? So we see here they're saying it's 105 fans, but it's 10 to 20 mile an hour winds. When we think about our fire seasons and some of the weather events that pass over us during that fire season, 10 to 20 mile an hour winds are, are not all that unheard of. And that's, that, in my opinion, is pretty common through the summer for us to have a day like that every few days. That we've got a, some kind of wind, if not higher than that. Then pine straw, just to pull out of that, it says pine straw, that's a, that's a term for pine needles. There's especially closer to the East Coast, they use pine, pine straw for a lot of the uh, landscaping around homes. Okay, so class A roofing, see all those pine needles burning in both the gutters and in the um, valleys of the roof there. And the class A roofing, for the most part, you know, there are definitely studies that show how deep those needles can be, but we want to make sure that we're cleaning all that stuff off, regardless of uh, really what our roofing material is, but we want to make sure that we're trying to get that class A and we're not looking at um, shingles, uh, shake shingles, sorry. So all those places, right, the that we see all the needles and the leaves gathering around our homes are also the same places that embers will gather around our homes. So as we enter into the fire season and we're thinking about those places like the corner of this house where likely there's lots of fuel there that, that uh, accumulate from wind blowing and needles falling, embers are also falling there. And those are receptive fuel beds that they're falling on if needles and and, uh, and leaves are in those locations. See the siding there melting, beginning to fall off as it's uh, fallen off and it's exposing the wood beneath it. That's the vinyl siding. The other one there was that uh, cement board siding, which is less combustible. We'll talk more about screens as we go through, but or, or vents, I mean, but vents should be getting screened, so we reduce the number of embers coming through. I think that's eighth inch screening on that, and most homes have quarter inch. You can see several embers that stopped that eighth inch. There's still some coming through, but significantly reduced the size of the embers that came in. And the window, the window is always something that um, I feel like I relate to. Oftentimes in the summer months, it's hot out during the night. You know, I don't have AC at my house. Um, I guess I do. I don't ever run it, run it, but I don't run it because during the night, you can usually open a window and let the cool in, cool air in. But during the day, I'm not always uh, diligent about closing that window. And um, you know, I'm thinking about how long this video was, 4 minutes, 17 seconds, which was... Um, they say it was all filmed in real time. It didn't take that long for that home to ignite and begin to burn, looking at the different types of material around it, the landscaping with the bark mulch, the window open. For that home to ignite and burn, it was only four minutes and 17 seconds. And in that amount of time, it's, it's quite likely that, you know, the fire department hasn't even uh, been warned or told that the fire is on, that the house is on fire. And I, I definitely would not know at all. And that would be further down the line. I would think it would take quite some time before I'd find out my home had burned. So that video shows a pretty um, kind of, uh, you know, it's not, it's not there to, to scare people, right? It's not there to scare folks and say, oh, I've got to do it because my home will burn down in four minutes. It's, um, it's there to help you illustrate and see the areas that we should be thinking about and the things that we should be addressing around our home. And then there is some awareness of, 
of becoming aware that it can happen quickly, but there are steps that we can take to prepare our home and, and do our piece of that greater picture. So a lot of that studies that have gone on comes from, um, from a study that was done by Jack Cohen. And Jack Cohen is a researcher that uh, he's been doing a lot of research in home ignition for, for many years. He's got a lot of uh, articles and papers out that he's written and, and worked on. So his, his work is something that we turn to quite often to see Kind of the that's kind of the underlying of uh, some of our defensible space and the concepts that we talk about around a home and how homes ignite. So let me get to this part here. Okay, so I'm gonna um, I you know I always hate when other people do this, so I apologize that I'm doing this, but I'm gonna read through some of this just because I feel like if I try to talk through it, I miss some of the points that I think are, are quite valuable in uh, Jack Cohen's work, especially related to this um, research here that's in this picture. So um, Dr. Jack Cohen's Crown Fire research was originally based on a model he designed in lab before he ignited the test plots to see below. So his modeling suggested that a Crown Fire would sustain a uniform heat of 1700 degrees for 90, sec for 90 seconds. So we want to remember that 90 seconds that the high intensity radiation will last longer than the actual burn time. So they thought, okay, it's gonna be really hot and then the radiation is gonna to continue to last after it's done burning. So his theory was that a wall, wall or a home needed to be set 30 meters or 100 feet, basically 100 feet. Um, the wall needed to be 100 feet away from the heat source to eliminate the risk of charring or ignition. In preparation, he constructed three walls, one at 30 meters, so 100 feet out, one at 20 meters, so 66 feet out, and one at 33 feet, or 10 meters, 10 meters or 33 feet. Um, however, when he ignited his test plots, he found that his models were an overestimate. So, the, so he had an overestimate of all of, uh, what he thought he was modeling, right? So the crown fire duration lasted less than 50 seconds. And if you remember, I said he was estimating that it'd be 90, but it actually turns out the, the crown fire and the heat only lasted for about 50 seconds. He found that there was no significant charring on either of the walls constructed at 30 meters or 20 meters. So there's no charring on either of the walls at 100 feet or at 66 feet. Um, there was some charring, but no ignition on the wall set at 10 meters from the crown. So let me see here. I think we get a couple zoomed in pictures of this. So that, that was his heat source that he'd set up. You can faintly see some of his walls out here. Well, you can see this wall quite well. And then here's a close up of his two walls or of his uh, 30, 30 foot wall. So his 10 meter or 33 feet. Um, so he had based his original prediction on the assumption that heat would affect the structure the same way it would affect humans. So the same amount of heat would give our skin second degree burns in five seconds. Wood materials, on the other hand, take 27 minutes to ignite. So he would, he'd set all these up thinking like, okay, well, I feel it this, and this, will, this is what it takes to burn our skin. So I would assume that this is gonna be the same for wood. And I think that last point there that you know, this heat would have given us second degree burns in five seconds. However, the wood material after doing all these studies ended up taking 27 minutes, um, 27 minutes to ignite, or it would, it would take 27 minutes to ignite the wood. So we can, I think all this to say, right, that, that we have some different assumptions about the the distance that we need to have away from some of those heat sources. But the reality is we, we need to make sure that we're still providing adequate space between our high intensity fire sources in our, in our homes, right? The more space, the better. But it doesn't, but the thing is, is the, the study doesn't, what it doesn't show is that we need to do the full 100 foot of moonscape around our home. It means we need to be thinking about it, but not all the way out to, um, we don't need to make moonscape. Um, so some of the things that are kind of interesting to note about this study, you know, if we look at the picture on the right side here, just the eave, that shading of the eave helped to um, keep the house a little bit cooler and, and kept this wall from, 
from charring, you know, and that, that kind of a scenario can also be applied to some of the, well, you know, I'll let Ed talk to this when he gets to the um, defensible space stuff here, but thinking about some of our trees around our homes and tying it together with some of those pictures that we saw from Ariel earlier, of the, the trees that were still standing, but were only charred on the side of the house. You know, it was, uh, I think in, when I look at those pictures, I, it always reminds me of kind of like, you know, it's the opposite of what we often think. It's not that the tree burned the house down, it's the house was burning the tree. So it was charred on the, on the side of the, that the house was. And oftentimes, you know, those trees are actually sheltering us from the radiant heat from the fire that may be out there, similar to the way that this Eve did on this um, wall. And then something interesting to note that I was told to be true, I don't know if it really is, but I was told that when they did this study after the, um, after they'd done all this uh, burning the wall, I mean, burning that, that stand of trees and then testing on this wall, that this wall at 30 meters eventually caught on fire, but it wasn't because of the heat or the intensity. It was because an ember had landed down here and some of this, um, some of this duff and material that was down by the bottom of the wall and it slowly smoldered and, and made its way over burning in the, those ground fuels until it hit that wooden wall and it caught on fire. And, and that definitely, you know, at least for me, I mean, that plays right into some of the experiences that I've had in, in, um, in the past where we've gone through neighborhoods working on the fire's edge and then hours later after we've been through the neighborhood, we've, we hear that a home burned down or hours if not a day later, a home ended up burning down in us because there was some, some spot that the fuel that an ember landed in some kind of receptive fuel bed, like bark, bark mulch or, or needles, and it sat there and slowly, slowly went and um, smoldered through the ground and crept across the ground until it ran into the edge of the house or the deck or the, the fence and then ignited the home. Um, so let's see here. And I think I went through several things there, but I was. That was our fire science piece of that. And then I'm going to turn it over to see if anybody has any questions as I kind of ran through that with a little bit ahead of schedule. So we have opportunity to discuss if anyone has anything they'd like to ask or talk about. I didn't know at this point at the top of my head. Okay, and then I don't, let's see, I don't think I see anything in the chat for questions right now. Um, yeah, I guess the big takeaways there are, are embers are one of the bigger things that we need to be thinking about. And that, you know, it's not, off, it's not generally the giant wall of fire, it's the, um, it's the embers and the places that those land around our homes. So let's see, it's 922 right now. Let's take a, let's take, a good solid 10 minute break to grab coffee, go to the bathroom, reset ourselves, and we'll start back up at uh, 9.35. Um, so about 9.35 to get rolling again. I see there's a question popped up in the chat here. It says, if fire propagates to the surface material, um, how much vertical separation is needed to prevent transmission? So and I think what you're getting at is how much vertical separation should we have for that fire to keep it from transitioning from the ground to the crown. And um, we use a loose rule of thumb and that's three times the height of the vegetation. So if we're, and we, and, and we wanna also, I think we have a slide coming up. Um, actually, I don't know if I have that in, if it's in this presentation or the other one, but thinking about our ladder fuels, we wanna make sure that we have that separation from the ground to the crown. And we, we use that rule of thumb at three times the height of the fuel. So if we've got fuel that's, you know, knee high or two foot tall brush, we want to have at least six foot separation between those two. So that's about what we need to have. Um, that's what we need to have for the separation um, between those two. And we, we want to think about those in ladder fuels because both those things can be considered ladder fuels. One, the first part is that brush underneath it and then how low those limbs are. So we'll make sure we have the limbs up high enough and then we remove the vegetation directly from beneath those trees. So we look at the drip line and then give it a little bit of distance outside of that. So if we've done those two things, right, if we've eliminated those ladder fuels, the way that that fire can climb from the ground into the crown, 
then we don't have that risk of having the crown fires, right? We can have a, a canopy fire or we might have a tree torch here or there, but we're not gonna have this giant running crown fire. And then remember, I wanna just back all the way up that it, it isn't crown fires that burn our homes down, it's the receptive fuel beds around our homes. So if those crown fires, they may be producing embers, but it's all about where those embers land. Um, do those land, embers land into a gutter that, that didn't get maintenance or did it land into some landscaping that was bark mulch around the home that directly connected to a fence that was connected to the house or right up against some kind of wood siding or what, you know, what are those vulnerable places? And oftentimes one of the ones that we don't think about, and Ed will get into it, is the, um, you know, do we have chairs on our deck that have flammable cushions and, and embers land on that? And next thing you know, that's on fire and it's right underneath the eave and it's, you know, that eave is capturing all that heat, preheating our home and catching it on fire. So those are the things that we want to think about. Um, so, yeah, yeah, and then there's a question with, and we're going to get to this too, um, uh, separation between like the bark mulch to our siding, what kind of separation we should get there, Ed will cover that here in defensible space in just a moment, he'll, he'll hit it really well, so I'm going to leave that to him. Um, so question about does the bin development code include mandates that developers and private home builders use fire resistant materials and landscaping materials? Uh, not necessarily. I know there's, um, there is like a vegetation enforcement code uh, for hazardous vegetation within the city limits of bin. And I, I don't, I can't really speak to it because I don't work for bin to be able to really talk about exactly what it is. But the, um, and then we do have some developers in a lot of the private home builders, especially on the west side of Bend, as we look at west side transect, they've set up a lot of um, a lot of guidelines for the landscaping, and they've been consulting quite a bit with several different agencies to to meet kind of the firewise, if you will, you know, the firewise or the defensible space standards that we'd be looking at or that we um, recommend. So they've been working in that direction, but not all development has that. Um, sorry, I'm looking sideways because I have another screen here with my chat. I can move over here. Boone, I would just uh, just add, so uh, in particular for fire resistant building materials, um, it's interesting in Oregon uh, that building codes are what we call uh, minimum maximum code. So the, the code that the state provides is the minimum requirement. It's also the maximum that can be required. Um, there is a uh, code amendment that's out there. Uh, the, the rule section is called um, R327 that's available for local adoption. The only um, local government in Oregon that's adopted that to date is Medford. Um, other uh, jurisdictions are looking at that, but holding off with the legislative session, potentially requiring that uh, building code section. So uh, that's the, the long and short of the, at least the building materials is that uh, each local government cannot write their own building code. They can write codes for landscaping materials, but uh, building codes need to be universal in Oregon. Uh, so you can either go with the, the basic code or the R327 code, uh, but you can't write your own code. Um, uh, and that's to provide builders with some consistency in requirements so that uh, you wouldn't have potentially hundreds of building codes across the state of Oregon that builders would have to meet. Uh, you'd either have the basic code or the wildfire code. So just wanted to address that. Oh, nice. I see um, Frank put that into, um, into the uh, chat there. He put a link to the bin. Um, flammable vegetation program there. Okay, so let's do, let's still stick with that. Um, 935, I have a feeling that a few folks have probably gotten up during these questions to go to the bathroom, but a quick break. Okay, hopefully people are coming back. I've got 935. Um, Boone, if you can maybe stop your screen share, I can start mine. Uh,
everybody seeing that for confirmation that somebody's back then i'm not talking to myself <laughs> yes i see it okay perfect all right uh just didn't want to get started talking to myself um <clears throat> all right so we're going to move along uh, those first three units that we uh, just finished covering are kind of uh hopefully lay the foundation for uh kind of the what i've called the meat and potatoes part of this class which is the um what is defensible space? What does that look like? Um, how to prevent structural ignition through um, building practices or retrofits, uh, and then putting it all together with the home assessment. So <clears throat> hopefully we're, uh, we set that stage and, and gave you a good uh, background on that. And I'm going to dive into uh, our section on defensible space. Um, so defensible space uh, is a, term hopefully most people have heard, but um, it's basically a zone around the structure um, that is made either more de defensible or survivable uh, based on the practices that we employ uh, using some of the science that we just covered. So uh, the, the, uh, the zones and the distances and uh, things around defensible space aren't just uh, magic numbers or made up numbers that we've pulled out of our hat or off a random number generator or anything like that. It is actually based on the, the some of the research that Boone just went over. In particular, uh, <clears throat> the distances are uh, really based on um, you know, studying that radiant heat load uh, through uh, Jack Cohen's work um, and then following that up with um, visiting several of these and unfortunately there's a lot a um, lot more um, examples uh, recently but the um, fire scientists visiting fires and um, studying how homes burned down and, and where those heat, radiant heat loads came from and where those embers ignited um, vegetation next to homes and then how that those uh, flames led to the structure igniting so that's what I'm going to be diving in here around defensible space. And uh, with defensible space, we do break it into uh, basically three zones. Um, and those zones have evolved over time. Um, we used to treat the first 30 feet from the home all as one zone. Um, and we have really uh, added a little bit of nuance to that um, in just the last few years. Uh, it has been a, a few years now um, since the, the, the first zone has been redu reduced down to that zero to five, and then the second zone being five to 30. And the third zone, as you can see in this graphic, uh, being uh, 30 plus feet away from the home. Uh, and that's because uh, of the, the, the tendency for people um, to overlook the first five feet or not do the intense work around the first five feet around the home uh, and, and thinking that they had good defensible space, uh, but leaving some of the details that might just be uh, lead to a smoldering fire that catches the structure on fire. And so we have a new emphasis on uh, zone one um, that I'm going to um, start us off with. See, there's a couple chats coming in. Hopefully those aren't anything that, uh, okay. Just wanted to be sure. Okay, um, so zone one, zero to five feet. Um, so the um, basically starting at the structure and, and working out, uh, we don't want you to look out at the vacant lot across the street or the federal land, the next ridge over and say, that's my problem. Uh, if you haven't done this work in these three zones first, uh, because that's really, again, where the science is saying, uh, where we can prevent home losses is really in the first, these first three zones, um, regardless of what happens beyond the three zones. So, so diving into these, zone one uh, is the, really the first five feet around the home. And it should be um, things that are considered to be non-combustible. Um, uh, I think of this as like a, a wick. So your defensible uh, space, all your defensible space zones might be the wick to the candle. Uh, and that fire coming from the wildland area into your defensible space zones, uh, we're hoping might be reduced, uh, you know, in zone three and really drop down or be eliminated in zone two. And then zone one 
really is our last chance to cut that wick off um, so that there's not any fuel continuity to the home from the wildland. And so um, really we want uh, that zone to be completely non-combustible uh, and can consist of things like um, rock or pavers or uh, bare dirt or uh, something else non-combustible, a, a well-irrigated lawn, uh, things like that. Um, this is a good spot for walkways around the home. Uh, there's lots of actual decorative rock options out there. Uh, there are more, um, you're seeing more of now than we used to see. Uh, this is not the place to have uh, bark mulch that lead, that, that's piled up right next to your home. Um, we should also um, be keeping uh, branches and shrubs and that sort of thing out from under the, the eaves of homes where eaves uh, would possibly capture that heat and carry that heat into the structure uh, or the flames into the structure. Uh, and it's also critical that we're doing regular maintenance uh, in this zone uh, of zero to five feet. Um, so I commonly see a lot of people really um, working beyond this zone um, and, and that's great, uh, but make, making sure that this zone throughout the fire season uh, that has already started here in Central Oregon um, uh, was legally declared last week by the, the uh, State Department of Forestry to be fire season and really uh, making sure that this this zone is, is maintained throughout that fire season that is really lasting uh, at least probably through September and sometimes into October here in Central Oregon. So a few examples of uh, things to watch for in zone one. Uh, avoiding foundation plantings um, and that, and, and we provided a link, uh, Boone sent out a, um, email this morning with two attachments. One of those has a link to the fire resistant plant guide that uh, Oregon State University has produced. Um, so if you do want to do any plantings in this zone, I would really choose low growing succulent type plants. Um, I would avoid any woody plants. I would avoid shrubs. I would definitely avoid trees in this first five feet of the home. Um, um, again, there's, there's other options out there. Uh, another thing to think about in this zone is um, things like what we have piled on our decks. Uh, every time I uh, think about decks, I think of a, a video that I, I saw a while back of uh, um, uh, a structural fire crew that was protecting a home and flames are advancing and the home's getting hit by embers. And uh, there was a, a a broom leaned up against the home and an ember hit the broom uh, and lit the broom on fire. And of course that broom was on a wood deck and luckily that firefighter was there and could move that broom. But it's uh, that's all to say that there's little things around the home that are in this first five feet that are very receptive to embers, whether it be the broom or your patio furniture with a, uh, uh, you know, a, a cushion on it that's, uh, that's gonna be receptive to embers um, and just be thinking about where you're keeping those flammable things right around the home and, and uh, potentially moving those out beyond that first five feet. Um, uh, hopefully an obvious one to not pile next to the home is firewood. Of course, this photo illustrates that, but um, if you think about firewood and how it's stacked, you have all those little gaps in there and you can think that when the wind blows, all the dry leaves and different things like that accumulate in all those little gaps in a pile of firewood. Well, I can tell you that that's where the embers are going to accumulate too. And so if we have wood next to the home um, and it's dried out and piled like that, uh, it's probably gonna be an ember magnet. And of course that's gonna be heat load that um, the, the home is not going to survive if, if a firefighter doesn't happen to be there to protect that home and put the, the firewood out. So that's not to say um, that maybe during the winter months uh, that you couldn't have a pile of firewood more handy closer to your home. But again, uh, once we go into fire season, especially, and thinking back, you know, to evacuations that we had in March, uh, really during any any time that we're you know not experiencing you know snow and wet weather, I would advise that um, 
the, the firewood stack next to the home is, is not a good practice. And I'd keep the, the, the bulk of your piles, you know, 30 feet away from a home or in an enclosed structure, or at least uh, in a covered, covered manner so that uh, if a fire does happen, that um, firewood uh, piles are um, ignited. Uh, so a few other examples of um, uh, the, the uh, preferred um, treatments around home. One here on the top left is uh, bark mulch that's right up next to the structure with an open vent and that the wind has obviously been blowing um, and that we've got again uh, that wick of the candle that's leading uh, that wildfire right into home and it may only be smoldering or it may be that the fire front doesn't even reach the, the property but the embers have blown from you know half a mile away or more and landed right next to this house uh, and there's nobody in the neighborhood that's really even thinking that the fire is there yet. Uh, it lands in bark mulch and that bark mulch has a direct wick either into the vent or in a lot of cases, right, um, if your siding extends down to your bark, bark mulch, that bark mulch is going to smolder and, and get um, uh, either ignite your siding or even if you have um, cementaceous type siding, uh, that is usually backed by a piece of wood. And uh, so if you have bark mulch right up next to your home, the recommendation is to separate that out with at least, you know, a few inches, if not more of um, some kind of rock material or just a break in anything that can smolder. Um, another resource that we've supplied a link to you in that uh, resources handout that Boone emailed is a study on different bark mulches and the gist of that study is that there are no bark mulches or organic mulches that are not flammable. Uh, there are some that are uh, less flammable so ones that are that are actually decomposed mulch um, that are more turning into dirt are a little less flammable but even those will carry fire up to the home so we really need to have a break in um, any kind of organic mulches, even if they're the more broken down, decomposed sort of mulch that doesn't touch the home so that we can avoid um, that smoldering fire from uh, igniting your siding. Uh, another example that you'll see throughout Central Oregon uh, is a, a common uh, plant that we see planted right next to foundations is our, our juniper type shrubs, juniper and arborvita are really popular with landscapers in Central Oregon, unfortunately. Um, they do have some redeeming characteristics in that they're, um, they really don't require a whole lot of irrigation on a regular basis. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that those are like having uh, a tank of gasoline next to your house. So in this case, I'd say like, I'd rather have a propane tank next to my uh, deck than this um, in this hedge of, of juniper. Um, and I could open that up for you if you were live on the site. And uh, there would probably be about a two inch rind of green along the top and everything else would be dead and red inside. And those, those are really flammable shrubs and something that we uh, definitely discourage people from having um, or planting uh, next to their homes or, or in this first five feet, or really even for, for those shrubs, since they are so flammable, even in the first 30 feet of homes. Uh, and just an alternative being, maybe that's the place to put your little rock walkway around your house uh, and then plant your shrubs out from there. So uh, something else to be thinking about and, and be aware of is that there are some pretty highly flammable shrubs that are commonly used as landscaping next um, so peeling back that shrub, this is an, an example. This one happened to be trimmed right before I walked by, so I got I grabbed a picture of this one, um, and uh, you can see that uh, these things accumulate lots of dead and red needles, uh, even though they appear to be green on the outside. So again, um, uh, this is really a shrub to watch out for because it's, it is pretty plentiful in our neighborhoods across Central Oregon and one that's very flammable. Um, another one of these, uh, same shrub, uh, same type of shrub. Uh, this was from a fire that uh, burned up near Lake Billy Chinook uh, in Jefferson County just a couple years ago or been a few years ago now um, and was ignited and and all and burned down all but the the green ends there. So uh, just another example that these things uh, do burn uh, and are discouraged. 
as one example of plants that are discouraged, especially in this first zone. Um, I saw a few more chats come in, so I'm just going to pause. If Boone, if you've been, or Ariel, if you've been watching those, or any of those ones we need to answer right away. Um, There's a question in there, Ed. Um, are juniper trees less combustible if thinned to crown of the tree? And is Trex deck less susceptible to fire than a wood deck? Okay. Um, I might save the decking one for the next section. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd say j just to answer that generally, yes. Um, uh, there are there are some uh, different decking materials, even some um, some hardwoods that are less susceptible. Um, uh, but yeah, so back to juniper trees and if, if they're more flammable or not. Um, if they're thinned out, yeah, I'd say so. I'd uh, I'd still um, just as we're moving on to zone two. In zone one, I would definitely still discourage any kind of flammable plants, including uh, juniper trees. In, in zone two, um, I'd say that um, you know a thinned out, pruned up type uh, juniper plant, if it's a single um, tree, would be. Uh, probably acceptable, especially if we've uh, broken the ladder fuels, which I'll get into here. But I'd say for zone one, I would I would still uh, discourage those, even though they'd be less flammable. Uh, the heat load that they would supply to the home in the form of radiant heat would, would be something that I would just be avoiding in that very first zone. Okay, I'm going to move on then to zone two. Zone two, uh, as you can see, hopefully in this graphic, uh, starts at that five feet where we left off of zone one and moves out to 30 feet. Again, based on um, uh, Dr. Cohn's research of wanting to really eliminate any radiant heat load to the structure in this zone. So that's really one of our primary objectives in this zone is to, or, uh, is to create a set of conditions that are not going to um, create a, a heavy radiant heat load um, onto the, the structure. And of course, the other one would be to still have plants that are, are if, if embers fall on them, are, are in a either well-maintained or uh, fire-resistant um, condition so that um, they're not igniting and, and uh, potentially threat, threatening the loss of the, the structure. So again, uh, all plants in this zone should be uh, well-maintained by uh, pruning or removing needle falls that fall from an overstory tree. Um, they should be uh, fairly well irrigated through the fire season, so we don't want dried out plants going into August uh, in this zone. Uh, and again, I would uh, encourage you all to um, be choosing plants in this zone um, that are uh, fire resistant. So uh, again, referring to the, the various resources that are out there, one that we've shared with you is OSU Extension's Fire Resistant Plant Guide. Um, there's a few others that are out there as well. Um, if you're looking for a wider range of choices uh, than what's in that particular plant guide, it is being updated. Um, but uh, choosing plants that are fire resistant is recommended for this zone. Um, having plants that are, um, are uh, lower in uh, resin contents or, or um, plants like bitter brush that tend to uh, burn very well. Um, if you do have uh, any trees in this zone, we're definitely wanting to limb them up. Um, I'm going to get into what we mean by ladder fuels, but we're wanting to eliminate any ladder fuels. So if we do have trees in this zone, uh, we don't have any fuels underneath them so that uh, we keep the, the uh, canopies from igniting, which again is going to both increase our ember load and also increase the, the heat load on the structure. Uh, we're wanting to remove anything that's that's dead, any needles, leaves, that sort of thing. Uh, that should be done uh, in advance of fire season. Um, one of the reasons we offer fire free that in the time that we do is to offer a chance for homeowners to get rid of this debris that's created by maintaining uh, this, this uh, second zone. Um, and again, moving on, let's see, moving on to the next slide. Um, 
used the term ladder fuels a few times. Hopefully that's not a new term to everybody, but um, in case it is, uh, uh, ladder fuels are, it, it is the concept that um, usually fire is going to be starting out um, on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the ground. And it is raised up in the canopy uh, of the trees uh, because of ladder fuels. So we're creating a continuous path from fire that's burning on the ground into shrubs or small trees, and then those lead into larger trees. And so one of the principles we really wanna employ in this zone is to remove all the ladder fuel. So it's, it, it is okay to have trees in this zone, but we don't wanna have a case that um, our shrubs or smaller trees are underneath our larger trees and those act as a ladder, um, ladder fuel that would then carry fire from the ground up into the tree. Uh, it's going to be, um, extremely rare that a, uh, trees really just don't burn from the top down. They're going to burn because they, they have, again, that radiant heat that carries the heat up, then it eventually ignites the canopy of the tree. Um, uh, and so we can avoid that by really focusing on the fuels that are on the ground and our smaller trees and shrubs uh, so that we're breaking that continuity so that um, if we do have a shrub, that it's not under the canopy of tree and that shrub burns, but it really doesn't ignite anything else around it because we've eliminated the continuity of fuels that would carry that up into the canopy. Um, one common perception that we get from people uh, that causes people to uh, resist uh, working on defensible space is the perception that they have to remove all vegetation uh, entirely from um, from these zones and that's that's a really a myth and it's not something that we're trying to promote really at all it's about making choices about what we do in these first two zones um, to choose those fire resistant plants to choose plants that uh, or choose a, a landscaping scheme that it may involve a little bit of irrigation in that first uh, the first couple zones keeping plants um, moist and healthy during fire season, well-maintained, those sorts of things. Uh, but we do not have to have what Boone was calling as the, the, the dirt donut around the home where we, we don't allow any vegetation. We have to cut down all our trees, uh, even though that is sometimes a, a perception of people. Um, I'd say just making the right choices of avoiding uh, the plants that are, that are more, more prone to ignition and then also thinking about how those plants are arranged in the zone so that they, if one plant catches on fire, it doesn't then spread to all the other plants in, in, the, in the, the yard of that zone. Uh, one thing you might be wondering, um, depending on which neighborhood that you live in, uh, in Central Oregon is, well, that's great. Um, I might have control of the first five feet, but um, my lot ends before I get to 30 feet from, you know, I can't, I can't even maintain um, 30 feet or 100 feet from my home because I, I live on a smaller lot or I live in the city and densities are such that um, I can't, I don't have control over that. Um, and this is really where uh, principles like um, firewise communities come in. And the idea that uh, basically we don't want any homes in a neighborhood to light on fire, especially if they're as close as they are in, in this situation, we certainly have neighborhoods throughout Central Oregon that are um, that are built close enough where we can have home to home ignitions or at least you don't have full control over your defensible space. Um, and we do promote um, firewise communities as a way for community members to work together towards a common goal of having all homes in their neighborhood safe with the idea that if any of the homes catch on fire, potentially the whole block could be at risk and presents a significant challenge for fire suppression. So um, we won't go into what all fire uh, wise communities are. Again, we did provide a link to a resource. We have a new fire wise story map that goes into what fire wise communities are. Uh, we do have over 40, I think we're sitting about 43 fire wise communities now. Uh, in Deschutes County alone. Um, uh, and it is a way for people to work together uh, to reduce the risks across um, communities. So I would check out that link if you wanna learn more 
about Firewise communities. I know that there's several people in this session today that live in Firewise communities, so this isn't a new concept to you. Um, again, just a, another photo um, uh, of what I was trying to illustrate here. Um, this home didn't actually ignite from a wildfire. It actually uh, was exposed to fire from a neighboring home. Um, and so all the, the damage you see to this home was the heat load from uh, the, the other, the, the neighboring house that had caught on fire. Um, and I just add this again, uh, because of the importance of, um, of, you know, if there's other homes in your uh, home ignition zone, that is also a consideration. It's not just about fuels, but um, as we've seen, unfortunately, uh, again, thinking back to the Labor Day fires, we had, we had a lot of neighbor, entire neighborhoods that were on fire. And it went from really being a wildfire to more of an urban conflagration where we were seeing home to home ignition because those homes were close enough together to catch each other on fire. But I, I would note a few other things on here that, that are kind of interesting in that um, hopefully y'all can see my cursor here, but this tree here on the one side was singed or, or burned off because of the, the heat from the home. But on the back side, actually, this, this tree didn't actually fully ignite. And not only that, but it actually provided some protection to this home in the form of shading. And so again, um, it illustrates the point that it is okay to have some trees in that second zone. Um, they're not necessarily going to light the home on fire. And in fact, are going to be um, some, sometimes still be standing uh, after the home uh, has potentially ignited or even burned completely down. So. Uh, we commonly see this. I saw this in probably hundreds of photos of the Labor Day fires from last year where there were uh, entire neighborhoods that were burned down and there were standing green trees that were still still surviving after those fires. Um, so that just tells me that there were other things like this radiant heat load that hit this, this part of the exposed house, broke the window out, um, carried fire to the house, or there were embers that got through uh, event or other things like that. So again, just, uh, just another thing to think about is that uh, um, your, your neighbor's home could be within your home ignition zone and, and it just calls for the fact of, or need for cooperation between neighbors in reducing risks uh, in neighborhoods that are built to a density such as this. Okay, and finally zone three, uh, we're moving out beyond that 30 feet. Um, and this is where, um, this is the zone that, that goes out from 30 feet to at least 100 feet if you if you could have a lot that's that far. Um, if you have a slope, you might wanna work beyond that. Um, but I wouldn't work beyond the, the 100 feet until you have a good defensible space uh, built out to 100 feet. Um, again, building on, on, on the research um, uh, that Boone had presented. Um, so in this zone, we're, looking at um, how we're arranging the vegetation, keeping and maintaining um, healthy vegetation um, through you know, pruning or removal of, of dead trees or shrubs, um, and uh, still considering uh, fire resistant plants in this zone. Um, I'm gonna provide just a couple uh, photo examples of, uh, of this one. Uh, of zone three. Uh, hopefully a couple of these will, or one of these will resonate with where you live. One's from a ponderosa pine type and others from a juniper type. And again, we're not saying that you need to remove all your ponderosa pines in this zone or all your junipers even in this zone. Uh, it's more about thinking about what is the condition of those trees and how, how are they arranged uh, such that there's not so much fuel continuity either um, vertically from the ground up into the tree canopies or horizontally as far as spacing out those those canopies so that they're um, so we have some space and so if one tree or shrub ignites we're not igniting the whole patch that is really going to be challenging for firefighters to uh, try to defend a home if, if we have uh, you know multiple patches of, of dense thickets of trees on fire so again uh, top um, Top left is a ponderosa pine uh, thicket, uh, and 
know, we've got a few large trees scattered out through here, uh, but then the whole understory is completely full of smaller trees. Um, and so the recommendation, again, if you're in zone three is you don't need to remove all the trees, but try to focus on removing um, the smaller trees so that there's, you're, you're breaking up that fuel continuity. Uh, you don't have continuous fuels from the ground all the way up into the canopies of the larger trees and that um, any of the larger trees that you leave remaining hopefully have some gaps in between uh, in between them. And, and uh, also tend to get questions about um, do trees need to be individual or in clumps? And my, my answer would be it's okay to leave trees in clumps, uh, two to threes, or, you know, that's uh, pretty commonly seen that you'll have a couple nice trees together. If you want to keep those, that's fine. Uh, we just don't want a continuous tree canopy all the way leading up to the home. So uh, if you want to keep your nicer trees and then create that gap where you might want to put in some nice shrubs or something like that, that's completely acceptable. Um, but just breaking up the, the ladder fuels and the fuel continuity. Again, another example from uh, a juniper fuel type uh, where this top picture um, has um, a con you know, really continuous canopy of juniper to the point where you can't really barely see the, the roof of the home uh, back here. Um, and that's not a condition that uh, is going to be very fire resistant. Um, um, we've got a lot of small junipers intermixed with just a basically continuous brush here in the foreground. So the, the recommendation again for this, oops, a little uh, scroll happy there, uh, is that uh, you're removing most of the small juniper trees, leaving the larger juniper trees, but those juniper trees are then pruned up um, and the shrubs are not uh, as continuous, but they're they're more like an individual shrub here and then a gap and then an individual shrub again. And maybe you have an opening in the background here where you're leaving a clump of shrubs, um, but that those shrubs are not right uh, underneath a tree. So just a couple examples of what we'd be um, looking for in, in zone three where we're, where it's, you know, okay to have some of that uh, native vegetation, but we, we do still want to manage it to the point where the fire stays on the ground. Um, and so we can still have our, our, you know, our nice high desert look and, and landscaping. Um, but it's also going to uh, really change the fire behavior if fire moves in from um, outside of your lot or your neighborhood and, and hits a place like this, we're typically going to see the fire drop to the ground to the point where pretty easily extinguished. Um, by firefighters. And so with that, uh, those are our three zones of defensible space. Um, hopefully that all made sense to you, but we'll definitely pause and see if there's either questions in the chat or again, I would encourage you, I think we have a minute or two uh, or maybe five minutes or, or so to um, um, take any questions or have discussion about something that either wasn't clear or that I I didn't get to that you were wondering about coming into the class. I'm going to stop. Yeah, there is a question. Oh, you were about to say it. Yeah, yeah go for it, Ariel. <laughs> Tag team it. Um, so we had a question of uh, what are your thoughts on ceramic containers next to or near the house with flowers planted in them? I. Um, I think that in, in a lot of cases, they'd be acceptable. I, I'd want to see this the specific location. Uh, I'm assuming that if they're flowers, they're being watered on a regular basis. Um, and it, so as long as they're healthy, um, th those flowers are probably, you know, not going to ignite uh, because there's really no, no woody parts to them. Uh, there, it's all green plants. So as long as it's, you know, in a green situation, um, a couple things that I would probably avoid is having, um, you know, ceramic container if it's, you know, full of, or it's topped with say like organic mulch or things like that, right touching the home or right under the eave. Um, but just moving that out a matter of, a, you know, a couple feet, um, would probably mitigate for that. If, and then that's a, uh, probably a slight concern, but um, uh, definitely I think something that would be, would, would be allowable, especially if it's irrigated, which I would be assuming it would be. 
Yeah, just to jump on with that one, on Ed, with that yeah. I just said, <clears throat> um, there was a, a, a visit with a community member a few weeks back, and he had exactly that scenario. And it, and it was kind of a mix of what he had there. You know, he had a couple plants that were uh, quite more flammable than others. And we had a discussion about moving exactly what you said, just moving it back a couple of feet, because some of them were flammable and set right underneath the eave. They looked really nice, and I felt guilty having told him that he needed to move them or that encouraged him to, uh, just because they were they were flammable material or flammable vegetation. Any other? I'm sorry. Yeah, you do have another um, question here. Uh, what kind of distance would would be recommended between shrubs like natives, such as sage and bitter brush, both individual and between clumps? How many in, in a clump is good in zone three? Okay, uh, yeah, sage and bitter brush in zone three. Good question. That's going to be something that a lot of people encounter. Um, I would say, you know, so, you know, sage and bitter brush are uh, on the, on the, um, on the scale of flammability or up towards the high end of flammability. So I would be, um, you know, gauging that based on the shrubs that you're looking at, uh, the sage and bitter brush as being, I would be keeping those fairly spare in this zone. I would be going with um, shrubs that are uh, probably under, you know, three feet in height, um, speaking in general terms. Uh, I would definitely be using that rule of thumb that Boone mentioned earlier, where uh, if, if you want a larger shrub, you're going to have to increase the distance to any surrounding trees. Uh, and so his rule of thumb, the rule of thumb that's commonly used is that uh, you can expect a flame height off of these plants to be at least uh, three times the height of a plant. So if you have a, a three foot um, sage, sage brush or bitter brush, you're going to, you're going to be seeing at least a nine foot flame length, you know, on a hot August day, maybe a little bit more with bitter brush because it burned pretty intensely. Um, so you're going to have, I, I would, I would gauge the size of my clumps or, um, the size of my plants, um, based on what, what the surroundings are. So if you have trees closer to that, you're probably going to want smaller plants. If you really want a good clump of sage and bitter brush, um, you're probably going to want to space your trees out more. So it's a little bit of a sliding scale in that, you know, what, what you want to place your emphasis on. Maybe you want a, a clump of hiding cover for quail or something like that. Um, that's something that you can, you know, potentially think about providing, um, but then you're going to really have to space your trees out or, or prune your trees to the point where those flames are not, you know, from that shrub that's really has a high likelihood of catching on fire. If you have a fire in, in, you know, that occurs, um, you can assume that th those, those shrubs are, are going to burn and they're gonna burn at that intensity that uh, leads to those you know, pretty, pretty good flame lengths. And so we're gonna have to want to space, um, space our, our surrounding vegetation out by, by that three times the amount. So that would be the general rule of thumb I'd give you for those more flammable plants. Um, yeah, yeah so, I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to add to that, um, that uh, there are some good documents out there that talk a little bit more specifically about what clumps could look like. And since Ed had mentioned, maybe some folks really like the wildlife that's on their property, um, but it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive in terms of fuel reduction that, you know, that that's not going to jive with wildlife habitat. There are ways to still have, maintain some habitat, but making sure that, uh, you know, there's, there's still reduced fuels and, and the fuel arrangement is still in a way that would still uh, fit in with this uh, home ignition zone concept. Um, so I'm gonna just post a document in the chat um, that uh, talks about wildlife friendly fuel reductions and um, that, that in there they talk a little bit more about clumps and, and gaps and things like that. And that would be really more applicable to spaces further away from your home. So I understand maybe some folks on uh, this workshop uh, may have larger lot that they live on. And so they can make use of, of this document. Definitely a good resource. I would recommend you all check it out. <clears throat> Thanks, Ariel.
Anybody else in the last minute or two that we have here before we move on? I don't see anything else. All right. Uh, let's see. The uh, question is, my home has cedar siding, not hardy board. How susceptible to fire is the cedar siding if there is 12 to, inches, eight, 12 to 18 inches of stone alongside the home foundation? Um, that looks like, oh, it came from Jeff, and I don't see him there. I saw it for a split second. I'll wait for him for just a second here. Pretty good question because I think that scenario exists with uh, several folks out there. <clears throat> I don't have cedar siding, but I do have wood siding, like, very similar with the uh, footing around my foundation. Maybe I'll come back to that question as Jeff gets back to the. Um, to a seat here, but I don't want to postpone the class too far here. So maybe I'll get us started here again. <clears throat> okay, well, I believe most everyone is back into their seats. Sorry, a couple more thing to do here. Okay. Um, so next we're gonna jump into um, structure ignition. And as we go through this section, I just wanna make sure I'm throwing out there that everyone is aware that uh, I'm not a home builder. So I may end up using the wrong term somewhere, but um, you know, right, I, I don't build homes. I once had a job during the summer doing that, but that was a, a long time ago. Um, and we're just gonna go through the home just like we do with a um, assessment that we'll be learning about later, but we're gonna be starting at the roof and working our way down and out and around the house. So we're going to be talking about the materials that give the home the greatest chance of survivability. Oops. And get my notes ready here. Um, yeah, so we're going to walk our way down from the roof out to the foundation. And we're going to start right there with the roofing materials. So Go into the roof. So roofing is classified into three different classes, generally A, B, and C. Um, and it's a, a matter of rating of, of ignition and that I'll butcher the definition here, but, um, but basically we're looking at covering that it's non-combustible or maybe a combination of materials coming together to make it non-combustible. Um, and class A is our is our highest rating of non-combustibility than B and then C. So some of our most common class A, our roofing materials incorporate metal or asphalt shingle or some kind of clay tiles or solar panels or concrete. And um, we have versus wood shingles. And technically you can get a wood shingle up to a class A, but it also generally requires um, yearly treatment and, I, and to be honest, I, I don't picture there's probably anybody out there that's doing the yearly treatment, keeping their um, roof, their wood shingles up to the point of meeting that class A. But we usually think about the, um, a lot of our asphalt shingles, like what most people have, composition roofing is another term for it. Um, that's the stuff that we're usually looking at that we want folks to be using. <clears throat> So the roof is the most vulnerable part of our structure. So if the home ignites, or if the roof ignites right, generally the, the home is destroyed. There's not much, uh, much turning back once that has happened. It's pretty much inevitable. <clears throat> Even if the roof isn't ignitable, we also wanna be thinking about what's on the roof and the way that it's built. So the way that a roof is built, even if the covering on top of it is not um, ignitable and is fire resistant just beneath that are you know all of the lumber that's gone into building the home so we do have um, stuff that's flammable right below it and we have points that that the home may be a little more susceptible to flame impingement so some of the stuff with the molding and the fascia boards we have quite a few components of it we've got the soffit where the um, where we have the overhanging eaves 
And we've got the siding and, and several other pieces of it. Let me see here. So we want to make sure that we're thinking about our ridges and valleys and our molding and our fascia. So all that stuff is pretty critical, right? So when we think about our valleys, we want to make sure that we're keeping those clean from all but all the debris. We don't have a big pile of needles gathering in those because after all, you know, eventually that heat will penetrate through, but it's a matter of um, time of heat on those roofing materials. And then we want to make sure that we have the maintenance happening. So we have a nice tile in this lower picture here. However, if the maintenance isn't being done in the, um, I can't remember the name of those, but bird blocks, I think, something like that. If those aren't being um, kept up with, or some of our maintenance is falling out away and our shingles are missing here and there, we've, we've added to the points of entry in places that embers can lodge and penetrate beyond the, um, the roof covering itself. So we've, we've had, and I think, I don't know if it's the next, yeah. We wanna think about some of our complex roofs. <clears throat> as far as um, how many valleys do we have? And it, this, this picture hurts my eyes. I can never figure out what's what in this picture I look at. I'm like, how does that roof even work? But it's, uh, we wanna think about how many different complex angles we have. And every time we have a complex angle, we've also added, or we potentially have added another place that embers may be gathering or another place that we may end up with um, some kind of place that needs maintenance through the years. Yeah, and let me get to the next one. I keep going to the wrong place trying to advance these slides. So this slide here is a, a bit of a more common kind of scenario that we see on the roofs. And this is where we, we want to think about flashing and stuff, but you know, having some of these kickouts and stuff and these dormers, um, you know, that's a place where we have in this picture, a wood siding that meets you know, the roof line in this place right here along that roof line where those two meet is a place that we would see those embers gather or those needles gathering and creating a receptive fuel bed. So there's a place that we want to make sure we're doing the maintenance. And then if we're able to, we'd want to extend stuff like this flashing that we see up here. We'd want to extend that down the wall to help give a little bit more separation. And the more separation we give between those two, the better. But you know, if nothing else, we at least want to be thinking about the maintenance that needs to go along with that. And doing that sometime around like right now, you know, the middle of May into the first of June before the fire season hits, before it sets in and uh, we begin to have some kind of threat. <clears throat> so our eaves, we got, there's kind of two different ways of um, these eaves are built. You know, the open and the boxed in frame. And the boxed in frame is, is generally a little more fire resistant than the open ones and for a couple of different reasons. But one is when you have that open, you have kind of that cupping effect of capturing heat. So that convective heat coming up through the smoke. And with smoke also comes embers. So smoke and embers are gonna be coming up into those eaves, capturing heat. We've also got radiant heat coming from that fire that may be near the home, drying out the materials. <clears throat> Whereas when you have the boxed inside, it doesn't capture as much heat that also means that we likely have a different kind of vent along that area um, that may not be as susceptible to um, ember penetration. And this, this last picture I just put up there, um, you know, when we think back to the eaves, um, this was the style that we had earlier on, and this was a charring from radiant heat, right? So this eave did allow for some covering from radiant heat, however, when we think about convective heat, if there was some kind of foundation planting right below it, we would likely be seeing a lot of heat capturing underneath this. But for radiant heat, we saw a lot of um, shading effect going on and protecting of the, of the heat. Yeah, and then also they had some trim boards that were on here that I think were supposed to replicate a window and they removed those also saw that there was no charring beneath that where they were shaded. So like I was just talking about, we have different venting that goes 
around the houses and there's several different styles that um that we see but i guess the the overarching like no matter where we're looking at the vent on our house the recommendation is that we're going to an eighth inch screening and when we watched that video earlier and we're going to watch one here in a second um that eighth inch screening is is decreasing the size of the ember that's penetrating the house the the home and envelope or whatever an eighth inch screen you know if you think about the size of an ember that can go through a quarter inch versus an eighth inch that the one that goes to that quarter inch is a larger um ember in it which means that it has more energy so it's able to go in and it's more likely to ignite something so if you go to eighth inch even though it's not blocking everything it is at least blocking some of those larger embers that would have that resonance time to be able to ignite something once it's within the, the home environment um i can't remember how these no, okay i'll go back a slide sorry so in the top left over here we have some of those boxed in um eaves over here versus some of the open ones different styles of venting. Um, same with the bottom right, we have another style of vent down here. But um, as we're looking at these, if we have soffit vents, those are generally a little bit better at protecting or keeping embers from penetrating. And then on the top right, we have two different styles of vents for our uh, main gable vents. One is the end gable, and it's a larger vent with the and most of those have that quarter inch screen, but if we're able to retrofit it, we can put this eighth inch screen into that and um, decrease the size of that. And then there's also these ridge vents that serve the same purpose as these end gable vents as far as keeping your attics uh, ventilated. But this runs all the length of the whole ridge, which is a um, really good vent for venting your house, but also for pr protecting it from ember penetration. So let's look at the video from IBHS, the Institute for Business and Home Safety and some ember penetration. <clears throat> so we're looking, yeah, so here we're seeing some different styles of the soffit eaves. So this is the boxed in um, style of vent that runs the strips along underneath your eaves of your house. <clears throat> So blasting embers at it, we're not really seeing much of anything come in. There's another style of a soffit vent here. Embers came in there, but not much of anything. Maybe we go to the next style here in a second. Oh, that's just, okay. Several different kinds of soffited um, vents here. Most new home construction, at least to, from what I've been seeing as I've been visiting neighborhoods and then just going to friends and family's homes, it seems that more and more of the construction of new homes leans towards a soffited vent, which is quite nice. And here's the end gable vent, right? You can see the screen is capturing quite a bit of the embers, or at least large ones, but there, there are a lot that still come through. And then here's the open eave vent where we saw the larger rectangle vent with the screen on it. A lot of embers come through that as well. A huge difference between this and the softed vents that we saw. And that's quarter inch screen too. So this, this is large screen. I didn't realize that before. So this isn't the eighth inch that has been recommended. And these fringe block vents with quarter inch screening. They also allow quite a few embers to come through. Vent the house well, but uh, definitely allow a lot of embers. And here's that same one that we saw a minute ago, but with eighth inch screen. Significantly less embers coming through it than what we saw with the quarter inch screen. Well, it's still letting some through. Like I said before, it's a smaller one that's coming through, so it's going to have less energy to be igniting things once it does come in. Okay. And yeah. 
so these are some of the ones we looked at, right? Was the end gable, so the, the vents are, that was letting in that mass amount of um, embers earlier. And then this was that other one that's the block um, style vent that was under the eaves in the eaves that we saw that led a lot through. So both of those, right, and we saw the pictures that we saw the quarter inch versus the eighth inch. If we're able to, we, we'd want to go to the eighth inch on those other ones, retrofit them. And a lot of the new homes have this style, the ridge vent, which um, my house is retrofitted with it, but <clears throat> not for fire purposes, it was um, other purposes. But either way, this ridge vent is, uh, is something you can have retrofitted into your home. It is a nice um, way of venting it without having to worry about it. And this is what those other ones that we looked at, what they look like from the outside of the block um, vents. And then those soffit vents that we were looking at, the strip soffit vents, they let in quite a bit less. less. Okay, so vents, I don't want to go on that for too long. I felt like I talked about it for quite some time. And it, watching that one video, I think, kind of sums it up without me needing to say much. Um, so siding, as we work down, so we've looked at the roof already, we looked at some of those vents, and then working on down to the siding. I think this is going to get to Jeff's question earlier too, and we can talk about this as we um, continue through it. But, you know, we, if we can, right, we want to think about non-combustible materials. So when we're building new homes or we're going to retrofit or change our house, we want to think about what we're using. And uh, a little bit of like counterintuitively, large diameter logs are on our list of non-combustible. But when you really break it down and you think about that large diameter log, it's nice and smooth surface. So there's not a lot of surface area to a large volume. So it's a little bit harder to ignite. So you think about your campfire and you're going to build a fire out there. You don't start with large round pieces because they don't light very easy. You start with small pieces that have lots of surface area to them. You know, and the surface area can come in the form of small diameter stuff like little twigs and stuff, or in some kind of a fibrous type of material, right, that has lots of rough surfaces. But a large diameter log is generally pretty smooth and has minimal surface area to the volume. So it has low surface area to volume ratio. Um, so treated wood sidings are also great. Um, and there is, um, or will work anyway, as long as it's being treated. However, you know, I, I've worked in, in a place where we had wood-sided um, building and, and I think even with us budgeting for it, we still were only getting that thing treated every once, every five years or something like that. And to actually have it treated the way that it's supposed to, to keep it up to um, fire resistant status, I believe most of that requires treatment every year or every other year, depending on what you're applying to it, which is really hard to keep up with at times. Um, of course, stucco or cement stucco siding is a great siding as well. Um, a rock siding, metal siding, and fiber cement. And, and to my surprise, I, I just re-sided something myself recently. And I was thinking that I would probably re-side it in wood because I was for cheap options and it was out away from my house. And I thought, oh, the wood will probably be the cheapest. And this was before wood prices went crazy recently. Uh, it turned out that the fiber cement, which lasts longer, and in my opinion, looked a little bit better, was significantly cheaper. So I ended up with a fiber cement siding on some of my outbuildings, which was, in the end, I was very happy with. But the fiber cement is, is quite well, uh, it's quite good. So some of those combustible combustible sidings is the wood, right? So untreated wood siding is, is fairly combustible. And especially if we think about how rough that wood is, we begin to go back into that surface area. You know, there's places for embers to lodge. There's a lot more surface area to, um, to ignite and, and become and to burn. Uh, vinyl siding. I know vinyl siding, we saw in the video earlier, um, right? vinyl siding does, itself doesn't so much ignite real easily, but it does melt and falls away from the, away from the wall. And then once that happens, and then we're exposing the wood that's just beneath it. And that wood beneath it is not going to be treated wood underneath the vinyl siding. And then synthetic stucco, which I, I don't think we'd see too much of that here in Central Oregon, but synthetic stucco is also uh, fairly flammable. And then, you know, when we're looking at this picture here, and it goes along with some of the questions that folks ask, and I think which is somewhat what uh, Jeff was asking on here too, is 
what if I have something like um, the rock around the bottom of the perimeter of our house? Um, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that helps significantly, right? And we, and when we tie that together with the pre presentation that Ed gave a minute ago with the um, defensible space, we want to be able to kind of incorporate those two things together. We're, we're making that disconnect between our, um, our home and the wildland. So if you have a wood sided house and it's, something that is uh, that's probably, you know, that you're thinking about, well, it's a little more combustible for whatever reasons, then what you need to do is, you know, you're recognizing that risk right away. So the next piece is how do you mitigate that risk? And then going to what Ed just talked about is one of the ways we do that is by separating it. And, you know, and by the, by the standards or by the book, you would want to look for a five foot separation there. And getting any kind of separation at all is definitely going to help out tremendously. But if we can, the more we can give that separation of that final disconnect between the home and the wildland, the better off we are as far as that zero to five foot zone. Um, I see a question here. I want to um, quickly take a look at it here. Yeah, you know, that, this was a question um, about ridge vents versus in gable vents that um, ridge vents are replacing fan vents. And I, I don't, you know, and I can't claim to be a, um, <clears throat> a contractor or a builder. So I can't really speak to that so much, but from what I understand, you know, at least in my place, I had the um, ridge vents were retrofit into it because my end gable vents were inadequate with the size for the venting required given the square footage of the home. Um, beyond that, I don't really know much more than that besides that's what happened to my house. Um, but those ridge vents, as far as I know, are, are nice vents as far as um, keeping embers out. Um, okay, so where am I at? So, whoa, that was pretty neat. Um, windows. So we saw windows earlier, and it's pretty obvious, right, that if we leave the window open, we're going to be um, leaving ourselves susceptible to flame impingement and having embers and stuff come directly into our homes. But what are the, you know, the question is, what are the windows that we should be thinking about if we're retrofitting or we're looking at a house or we're living in the wildland urban interface or, or we're wanting to harden our home a bit, a bit more? You know, we want to think about whether they're single pane or dual pane. Um, and then whether their the glass is tempered or not. And by the building standards of um, home efficiency right now, our, most all of our homes are, um, I believe the code actually, and Ed can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, um, the code requires um, dual pane tempered glass as it sits now. So any new home that's being built already meets kind of the standards of what's being recommended for um, windows on, on homes. However, there's a lot of places that still have either older dual panes that are um, not tempered glass or um, are single pane. And the, the tempered glass means that it's going to withstand heat to higher temperatures before shattering or breaking. Because right, once it's shattered or, or broke, you know, we have that open hole that now allows the, the fire to enter our home. And then single pane, of course, is gonna withstand much less heat than dual pane. And then the fine, final piece of that is the frames, what are the frames made out of? Are we going to, you know, I think we actually, let me go to this next slide. You know, is it going to be something that melts and falls away and allows for entry points or places for embers to lodge? You know, we want to think about how that fits into the whole thing, whole picture. I know that um, oftentimes the replacement windows that go in are, are these vinyl frames because of the efficiency with heat. And some of the older ones were the aluminum frames, which are less uh, likely to melt and come out than the um, vinyl, but somewhere we, we've got to make our decisions of what we're accepting as an acceptable risk out there. And being, being aware of it is half the battle, right? I love this picture. This picture is kind of fun just because I just picture myself in the, that position of the firefighter, of like like responding to a fire. You walk up and you step around the back and you're like, whoa, the whole fence is on fire. And like nothing else is burning here. 
uh, but the fence is definitely on fire. Um, and Ed talked about this a little bit earlier that when we look at attachments to the homes, we, we need to think about those as being part of the home. So if we have a fence and it's connected to our home, you know, that's one more, you know, we see that as part of the home. So we need to be thinking about that zero to five foot separation around it. How are we keeping that fence from igniting or how are we keeping the fence from igniting our home? And there's different ways about doing that, right? And creating five foot down each side of your fence sounds a little bit ridiculous uh, in my opinion, but the other side of it is you can, you can do things as simple as this, right? Is when it comes back to the house and you come around to where the, the fence would connect to the house, um, perhaps all you need to do is put in some kind of a metal gate decorative or whatever works for you, but at least making that separation between that wooden fence to your home. I mean, I would hate to come home and see and see this one, right? The fence is on fire and it's just slowly inching away to your house without you realizing it. Um, yeah. And we had some questions about this earlier, but decks and pavers. So, right, and, uh, and I think that is obviously the difference between a wood deck to a paver, which is more flammable. But, we, but decks are the same as the fence. If the deck is connected to the house, then it should be treated as part of the house. After all, it's, in most cases, it's a giant wood structure that extends off the home that is very susceptible to ignition for the most part and that and the ignition can come from different places whether it's um, embers landing onto furniture like this and the furniture ignites and it sits underneath an eave of a home and it ignites or it's landing on um, a wooden deck that maybe has pine needles on it or or just some kind of area that it um, ignites easily and then the other part is is whether or not, actually I might have a slide here. Well, yeah, or is it a wood deck that, um, that sits off the ground or, or has some kind of a receptive fuel bed where it creeps through the bark mulch or the pine needles and then hits the deck and ignites the deck. And, uh, and this slide actually is um, to, to kind of get to the point of if you're gonna have a deck, um, you know, you shouldn't treat it as a storage facility, right? Because if you have wood and stuff underneath your home, it, that's a, a quite the heat source that is sitting there just waiting to be ignited. Um, you need to make sure that you're doing the adequate kind of maintenance with your deck. And depending on your deck, you know, I, I, when we go out and talk with people, the usual line that I tell them is if you have a deck that is um, low to the ground and you can't get underneath it to to clean out the needles that gather beneath it, then you should be thinking about screening it with eighth inch screening so that so nothing does go underneath it. So you don't get the needles to go under there in the first place. And then you also don't get the um, follow up of embers if there is a fire in the area. And then if it's a high enough deck that you're able to get underneath it, then you wanna rake that stuff out and keep it clean so you don't have that receptive fuel bed beneath your deck. And then in this case, you know the, the wood is being stored under there. So not only is there a, a receptive fuels down there, but there's also quite the accumulation of them. You know, this would be the worst case scenario. You walk around and that, that pile is on fire. Um, to put out a pile of wood that large, it would take quite a quite amount of work and water to actually put it out. It's gonna be a pretty, pretty intense hot fire in one spot that's going to, I would say almost for sure, ignite the deck from underneath, which I'm sure the deck is connected to the home. So same thing here, this is, um, this picture I feel like is like a deceptive picture a little bit, because you look at the deck and you think, oh yeah, it looks all right. And then you see all the green grass and the vegetation around it. And you're like, oh, they keep that stuff watered. And it's like, well, maybe they do. But and what I, what I see from my point, of, my point when I look at it is like, well, they have the, they have lattice. So the lattice is, um, you know, it's susceptible to burning. It's not a live plant, so it's not pumping moisture through it all the time. So it, it dries out like any fuel pot particle on the landscape. And then a lot of this vegetation beneath it, here we have all this wood chips down here with mixed within. And I'm like, well, there's a receptive fuel bed. So thinking back to those ground fire images with the pine needles earlier, 
it's very similar to that. We've got the wood chips down there that would allow for a ground fire that would likely creep through the wood chips, ignite the lattice, and the lattice would ignite the deck, and the deck would be, um, you know, potentially um, would potentially ignite the home. However, you know, I, I say all that and I criticize everything they they have there, but there are a lot of good things to recommend recognize as well, right? This this homeowner did a lot of work here to give them separation from the home out so they've got a bit of their zero to five taken care of for the non-combustible space which is really awesome and they've done a lot of work all the way around and most of their plants look like they're uh, more fire resistant outside of this arborvitae that's sitting right here in the middle so they've done a lot of work there so when you look at it and you see these last couple of things like man if they just do these last couple of things they've got the full package and you know, i'd hate to think that they did all this work for nothing and then had something like this sitting out there waiting um, to cause their home to ignite. Now, there is a short story because I think we have plenty of time here. We were um, several years ago, I was visiting a community, walked through it, and there were a couple of homes that had um, burned down. They, someone had mentioned, I was talking about bark molds to the community, and they said, well, maybe we should go to the two homes that burned down last year. I didn't, didn't know what they're talking about. So I was like, oh, okay. So we went out to them. And uh, there's two homes next to one another. And then so one of the homes was a rental property and um, like a, uh, a BRBO. Um, and they went, uh, somebody had rented the place either way. And, and I believe they were smoking out the back deck, but they'd thrown the cigarette out. And it was, I don't remember the time frame from when those people had left to when the home was reported to be on fire, but it was a fair amount of time, right? The cigarette had landed into the embers off the deck laid into the um, bark molds for quite some time and slowly crept across until it did hit, you know, one of the supporting beams or whatever it was on the deck and ignited the home. And then when that home burned, you know, those homes were close to one another and it, and for whatever reason, I don't know what the other house was looking like, but I'm sure it had um, bark molds all the way to the foundation. It had, it had also ignited and burned down as well. It's like, well, that's quite unfortunate. So the talk that we were talking about with the bark molds was really was driven home quite well the funny part at least not funny is very relative the coincidental part that's the right term um a couple years later i was at my sister's house and i was talking to her and she was living in bend at the time and um and her neighbor was there and we we're talking to her neighbor and i said man your house I was like, you've got everything done for defensible space. Like he, he had done everything to a T, you know, all the pieces and all the steps. I was like, you don't even have bark mulch around your place. I was like, you know, there was a couple places in this neighborhood where, you know, I started telling the whole story and he cuts me off. He's like, that was my house. He's like, I was so mad. He's like, the neighbor's BRBO burned my place down while I was at work. It's like everything I owned was in it. He's like, by the time I was called, that thing was fully engulfed and it was gone. He's like, so since then, he's like, I, I do everything I need to to make sure that my home is fully protected. I felt really bad after realizing what was going on and telling that story. But but those are the little things that we don't think about that kind of sneak up on us. And I know for for sure as a firefighter, we, I think back to all those times of those homes that I've heard that burned down after the fire passed through. And the only scenarios that, you know, that really come to mind that allowed for that to happen was the bark mulch around it or the, the needles and leaves that were in the gutters that people just didn't realize were there or we didn't see either because we were you know, trying to attack the fire or trying to um, work on the fire, which all goes back to that point too, that you know we're all doing our part out there, right? Including the firefighter. And if the firefighter has to come in and do our um, defensible space around our home, then they're not doing the piece that they're intended to do, which is manage that fire before it gets to the, to the residents. So we, we wanna make sure that we're doing our part of it. Um, as far as prepping our homes. Okay, so I'm getting off subject here. Okay, um, so next slide is our maintenance. Okay. So when we're thinking about our home and we've done all this work or possibly we've got work that we wanna get done and maybe it's something like this top right where we wanna change out our shake shingle roof but we, we can't get to it because you know uh, monetarily it's hard to replace a roof. But at least we can think about our maintenance and what we can do to ensure that we're given the best odds we can to our to our um, situation. So 
you know, that includes getting rid of those needles that are in those valleys or collecting in those gutters. Because right when we saw that picture earlier of the um, of the home and how the roof is put together, right, all this, all, everything underneath that covering is wood. So if we have gutters that are full of needles, we're just creating a nice little uh, bed of uh, bed of receptive fuels that are ready to ignite. And if you think about building your campfire, basically everything is poised here to build a nice little campfire right up the edge of the house. Same with the roof. And then it goes all the way to the things that we don't really think are all that, um, you know, all that special or really are really causing us any kind of, uh, um, you know, you're not really worried about it so much, but something as simple as a crack in your siding, you know, and if you look at this picture, you've got all the the bark beneath it so easily you can picture having a fire in the bark down here and then having places within the crack that are allowing for embers to lodge in and begin to ignite that stuff or allowing for heat heater embers to go beneath or behind that that uh siding so doing small maintenance anything from the larger stuff of cleaning out our gutters and cleaning off our roofs to making sure that our siding is in good order and make sure that we don't have those places that are points of entry so lots of things to think about there. Um, <clears throat> I think actually I've uh, run through that portion of the presentation other than right here. Let's take a look. So from start to finish, we're gonna start with our ember generators, which we use to recreate a realistic ember exposure. Embers are those small burning and smoldering particles that may travel ahead of the fire plant. And what we do with our generators is we create the realistic exposure and in our wind tunnel we're able to throw them at a building. And then we have a building that has two sides to it, a good side which uses wildfire resistant construction and what we're considering a typical building that we would see in a wildfire program. Oops. Can you guys not hear that? Sounds coming through, but not great, but you can't hear it. Exactly as we expected, that mulch on the ground there caught fire from the embers. The fire from the mulch burned up under this, this deck, and this whole deck was on fire. And so this fire on this deck caused flames right against the home, and then if we look there at the base of the door, there was actually the flames from this deck that burned through the bottom of the door and on the inside of the house. You see smoke and flames. And so because this deck was a combustible okay. material attached to the building, when the embers led to the ignition of this deck, we got flames inside of the building. Here we are on the wildfire resistant side of the house where we had non-combustible siding, a five foot non-combustible zone and a six inch gap. We had a metal gutter and multi-pane windows. And we see in comparison to the non-wildfire resistant side, this side had the same ember exposure. If you look here in the mulch, you can actually see some of the embers that had accumulated, but because they had no susceptible fuel to ignite, they just landed there and fizzled out. Now here where we have ornamental vegetation, that again is susceptible to the embers, but because it's more than five feet away from the home, it didn't have enough energy to ignite and it never led to a flame impact on the building. Okay, so, so I apologize. I didn't realize this whole time that you guys weren't able to hear those videos as well as I thought you could. It was uh, quite some time ago. I turned off a setting in my Zoom and then uh, it, was just, it was just brought to my attention that I had it turned off. You guys are only partially hear, hearing those. But yeah, that was another video from IBHS. It's a really good one. There's, um, those are pretty easy to find on uh, YouTube, but those IBHS they put out several small short videos on just small pieces of defensible space and home ignition, structure ignition. Uh, and, it, and they're pretty good stuff. You know, I looked at some last year, right around the end of the season, and they were putting them out really quickly. And it looked like they were at the Almeida, Almeida fire down there um, in Southern Oregon. And they, they were showing some pretty cool things that were, that were like directly to the point. You could see very easily when they talked how they, uh, how that was happening and how those structures were igniting. Okay, 
So we've gone through structure ignition there. Um, hopefully people are getting a better picture of, and I'll open up to any questions here. And right, we're, you know, we don't have such a big crowd that uh, I'm not really afraid of people coming off of mute and just throwing out questions if you want, but by all means still use the chat, raise your hand or come off mute and we can, um, if you have any questions. This isn't so much a question, but um, I just wanted to say that it's really not that hard in some cases to buy a little bit of eighth inch um, venting wire and I mean, the mesh and reinstall it on your on your current vents. That's that's what I did a number of years ago. Yeah, it's actually quite quick. And you know, that stuff, if you go down to like Home Depot or Lowe's, um, I believe they call it hardware cloth and it's eighth inch hardware cloth. I've got a roll of it here for a few different reasons, but it's, yeah, it goes right in. You can staple it in nice and easily. Thanks, Jane. Okay. Well, here and none, I think I'll turn it over to Ariel. And then if you think of something you want to ask, throw it in the chat and we can discuss. But Ariel, it's all, all yours. Great. Could just go off of your screen or I could share mine back into the, there we go. All right, so uh, uh, we're rounding the corner, uh, coming up on home stretch. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the moment you've all been waiting for, uh, we're now able to get into home assessments, um, you know, what you can do uh, around your home. Um, you know, we've given a, a run through of all the great suggestions from uh, Defensible Space that Ed talked about and uh, structural ignition prevention that Boone went over. Um, but they put together this fantastic form, this home assessment form that you can use um, and uh, you can also share with your neighbors, with your community. And so uh, Boone, did you send that form out to the group? I wonder if everyone was able to get yeah, a hold of that I did, form. And you know, I was going to see about um, putting, dropping it into our, um, into the chat right now so people can look at it if they're um, curious of it. So look for you here yeah. in the chat, just like two minutes. Great, great. Yeah, so once he's posted that, or if you find the email that he sent out with that home assessment form, um, I recommend pulling it up if you can um, and uh, having that nearby um, as we go through the next portion, the last portion of our workshop. Um, so really um, for the home assessment process, um, it can be broken out into two main parts, um, the peak to the foundation, and then the foundation out. So top, down, out is how I like to think about it. Um, so, you know, we start at the home in the center of a bullseye. And uh, since it is what we are wanting to protect, um, that's where we put our focus first and then move out from there whenever we uh, go through this home assessment form, um, looking at your own home and sharing it with your neighbors. And you can even do a walkthrough for your own community. I mean, sure, uh, with FireWise uh, assessments, um, you, you know, you get a community walkthrough with uh, either Boone or um, other folks who are involved in that. Um, but uh, this is something that, you know, on your own time, you're able to do and, and share with your neighbors. Um, so, you know, it, we'll just be looking at uh, through this form uh, examples um, that uh, we're looking at, you know, roofing, vents, uh, eaves, um, siding, uh, any, you know, fences or decks that are attached to the home and then go out uh, zone one, then zone two, and then zone three. Um, so now we can get into some practice home assessments. Oh yes, here's the home assessment form. Um, this is what it looks like. And uh, really, I, I like it a lot because it's really straightforward. 
um, and you can just fill it out on your own. Okay, so uh, jumping right in, and this is really when we're going to be using the chat box, or you can come off mute and say what ideas that you have, but um, focusing first, uh, looking at zone one, uh, well, focusing on uh, the, the home, and also that zero to five foot area. So for our first example, imagine you're physically there looking at this home and what do you see um, uh, for that uh, area from the top down and that first zone that kind of stands out to you. Um, that would be something to consider changing or potentially be an issue for home ignition. So if anyone wanted to put in the chat, uh, what do you think about the roofing? Does it look flammable, not flammable? I'm trying to pull up the chat so I can see it too. <laughs> and I can't see the chat. <laughs> um, so one of them, uh, trees overhanging the roof. This is one of the things people are looking at. Looks Great. like a steel roof. Mm hmm Yep. So we could. Yeah, oh, we there we go. I found I found my chat box <laughs> hiding behind other windows, of course. Um, can I make it a little bit bigger? Yeah. Good point. How's that? Does that help? <laughs> um, so yep, we've got trees overhanging the roof. Uh, but first we'll look at what the actual material is. Um, so, yep, looks like it's a metal roof. Um, and so would that be flammable or not flammable? That's really not flammable. So that's, you know, I would give this point. This is where there's a little section on the home assessment form, the uh, space for notes. And so maybe if you had seen needles accumulating on the roof, you could write that in those notes there. Um, and then you could also write in the notes there about um, if there's branches that are touching the roof that maybe could be uh, limbed. Okay, so now moving on through to the vents. Uh, so it's, I, I don't, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ariel, I'm gonna jump in just for a quick second. Here. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think lots of people are seeing the overhanging limbs, right? And I just want to make sure we're all framing it up and seeing those the same way, right? Is that if those limbs are overhanging the roof, the potential of what they're adding to for susceptibility of ignition of the structure is additional needles falling onto the roof and, and accumulating. It is, you know, if we look at those trees there and uh, you're about to jump into it, they... And, and the same thing that we all talked about is they don't have ladder fuels and the fire moves from the ground to the crown, not from the crown down to the ground, as Ed pointed out earlier, but the, the overhanging limbs are more of a um, concern from their um, deposit of needles than the tree actually catching on fire. That's, yeah, that's a good point um, to be more specific about why we would be concerned about the uh, branches overhanging the roof, um, that it's more of a, a contributor of, of needles, um, which, you know, then you would have to be very mindful of maintenance um, so you don't have that uh, receptive fuel bed just sitting on your roof or, um, you know, next to the home. All right, um, any other points or comments on that one or questions? Yeah, so uh, moving on through to vents, as that's the next one on the home assessment form. Uh, I don't really see examples of vents in this picture. Um, I mean, if we were physically there, then we could take a, a, a better look at seeing what kind of vents they are, and then uh, noting whether they're screened or not screened, and then making the recommendation for them to be screened with that eighth inch mesh that we were talking about. Um, and then for 
eaves. Uh, anyone notice what kind of eaves we've got going here? And if there's any concerns with that? You've got a comment in there from um, Jane that it's open soffits, but it's open eaves and then there, so it doesn't have the soffit style vents. So it's likely got those block vents up in there instead of the, you know, mm -hmm. to the soffit ones. So yeah, for those, whatever, yeah. But that's a great comment, Jane, that, you know, the vents could use that eighth inch mesh screening, metal screening. Um, and uh, I wish, I wonder if you guys could see my cursor. Maybe not, but whatever the case, uh, take a look at those. Yep. Um, you can see it. Well, you can see it. I was right. just letting you know we can see it. Great. Okay, so yeah, uh, look we got here. Um, those, you know, they're, they're open. Um, and so instead of being boxed, so you, you would note that, that this is another area that um, embers could come in and um, that, you know, um, a goal for having more box eaves would help with um, preventing those embers from getting in. Okay, so then moving on, uh, what about the siding? What kind of siding does that folks think that that looks like? Is that flammable? Is it not flammable? Looks like T111. Say that again? It looks like T111, which would be flammable. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, hard to see. Um, it could be that um, that cement board that Boone was talking about, the fiber cement. Yeah, based on what you see of that deck, though, that, that's definitely wood on the verticals there. I expect it's the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that it could be. So if we were there, physically there, then we would be able to say, uh, exactly what kind of siding this is and make note of, you know, whether it's a flammable material or not, and then put in the recommendations for that, you know, whether it's, this is your own home assessment or for your neighbor, uh, the recommendations of what they could do to replace that siding um, to make it more of a non-flammable, um, non-combustible material. Um, but yeah, Jane, you were mentioning the decks. So that's, uh, the next piece here uh, on the form, looking at attachments, which would be decks or fences. And uh, you mentioned that it looks like wood. So, yep, that, you know, it's, it's combustible, um, but at the same time, uh, we don't know whether it's treated or not. Well, yep, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Um, yeah, so at least we can be looking at, say, on the back side of this deck, there might be more of that space underneath the deck where a lot of these pine needles are probably falling through the deck and accumulating. So thinking about the maintenance of those, um, that debris accumulating and any other thoughts on what you could do with that deck? Well, you definitely see on the edge toward us that there are pine needles accumulated against the vertical wood siding, which I expect that's a really nice channel for fire. Mm -hmm. You also have your cushions on your chairs, which, you know, that's the hardest thing to tell people if they're going away for the weekend or something, take your furniture cushions in. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to do that. Sure, so. sure. And I don't know about propane tanks if, or, or whatever fuels that uh, grill in the background. And, and that's a question people have asked me is, what do you do, do you, if, you're, if you know you're gonna be exposed to fire and you're evacuating, what do you do with those tanks? Um, or do you need to bother? So a couple things. 
the typical thing I say, I'll jump in on the propane tanks. It's a typical thing. I'd say. I mean, if you have the luxury of time, uh, and sometimes you do, um, you know, better to store those in a garage than leave them out. But if the propane tank is catching on fire, you've probably got bigger issues already um, than that. So I, I wouldn't make it my number one priority um, as far as things to do around the home when you're needing to evacuate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, if, if you're leaving town, you could store them. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with what Ed was saying. Um, and, and so, yeah, getting back to the deck, you could add that eighth inch mesh also along that area that is exposed um, where there's a gap, there's space, um, you know, that really does help prevent those critters from building a nest under there. And that's just more flammable material. Boone, were you about to say something? No, well, I guess I was, but I was going to leave it. But the, the propane tank, just what Ed said was exactly what I was going to say. I was recently out with a landowner, homeowner, and they asked about the propane tank, and they had everything cleared around it. And they said, well, should we have it further away from the house? And I said, well, the only way your propane tank is going to catch on fire the way this sits is if the house is on fire. So it's kind of the house is going to catch before your propane tank will. But that's not always the case, but that was their case in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. So now we can think a little bit more, because right now we're focusing on the house and the first zone, which is zero to five feet. Uh, is there anything else that we see that is within five feet of this house that you know, what kind of rating would you give it? Would you say it looks pretty good, non-combustible, or would you say there's combustibles present? Well, how about the trees like on the left side there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are, they're kind of limbed up, but... Uh, that, that small one looks like it's within five feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, John. So, um, you know, sure, some of these smaller trees, they might want to consider if they are, I mean, it's kind of hard for me to tell in this picture how close that really is, but if, if that is within five feet, I would want to uh, make sure as, you know, Ed was saying how that area we want to be, uh, have the least amount of combustible material within 5T of the home. And actually this is something, I'm not sure if we went over this, but I would say the footprint of the home is including your um, uh, deck because your deck is attached to the home. So think of that five foot space, even out from the deck around the deck of the home. And Frank was saying, looks to be a moderate amount of dry needles on the ground mm -hmm. and the plastic patio furniture, right? Susan was mentioning the plastic chairs. Um, and uh, would they be a consideration since they can melt in high heat and possibly burn in the decking? Um, I would say, yeah, they, they would melt, but I, I mean, Boone or Ed, what would you say about that? Because I don't think that's necessarily uh, the biggest concern of where flames could originate from. No, but it, it's something to think about, though. I mean, right in this scenario, they're way out on the deck. The ones I look more so at the ones with the big cushions because I think they're going to be most flammable. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't want those left out, regardless of really where they are. But if they're closer to the house, like these plastic red ones would likely be a heat source near the home. So you probably want those off. And if you're going to have something out there, you'd want to probably just have those metal frames out there, not the cushions or the plastic chairs. And there, there is a fair amount of needles, like you guys said there. Those are the two big ones I see is that there's furniture left out and then there's needles within that zero to five that have been raked away along with what you covered with uh, screening the bottom edge of the deck. Right, right. Yeah, so uh, the examples we looked at earlier were 
um, could be a really good recommendation for this home of um, putting in some, uh, you know, gravel, rock, or a, a, um, some kind of walkway could be a, um, a pavers or a walkway around this home for that uh, zone one, zero to five foot zone. It looks to me like that deck would have enough space between the boards for the pine needles to just fall directly in and and then the embers and then burn it all up. So, you know, I, I would probably ask if these people could afford it. I would think they should replace that deck with something that wasn't quite as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a tough thing because I think a lot of people are really attached to their decks, but um, it's just a, a risk that that folks should be aware of. And at least, you know, what kind of decking materials, if they have the money and the time, maybe this is a long-term outlook that they could work on it, plan for it next year of uh, replacing with something different, perhaps a patio um, uh, or, you know, different decking material. But yeah, because there's so many pine trees around this home, you're just gonna keep getting a lot of that needle accumulation. Yeah. Oh, we got a question. Jenna, join us. <laughs> Sorry, let me see if I can unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, just one thing about the decking thing. I recently watched a kind of a home ignition type of workshop similar to this. And one thing they mentioned that I thought was pretty clever was just taking the one or two boards that are right up next to the home and replacing them with a non-flammable um, option instead. Uh, and just you still utilizing and having the wood decking, but then just creating that separation between the side of the home itself and the deck. Um, so I thought that was actually a pretty clever way to, to handle that. Yeah, I like that because then that separates the deck from the home. It's no longer an attachment if you're disrupting uh, where it would normally connect to the home. Right, especially because um, that's where a lot of the embers accumulate, right in the corners where it meets mm -hmm. the home too. So just, just kind of wanted to throw that out there. No, that's great. I hadn't heard that. That's a um, really good comment. Thanks, Jenna. And, and likewise, Oops. the same would hold true for a, a wood fence that at least the part, I think we went over this earlier, but the part where it connects to the home that you can disrupt that connection and replace that part with maybe metal fence gate, you know, right next to the home or something like that. Um, yeah, there's just, there's ways around this. All right, so. Arnold, this is John. I, yeah. I apologize if Boone covered this in the discussion on decks, but did we talk about the um, relative flammability of the different decking materials like uh, the Trex type products and things like that, where they look like wood, but they're not, you know, they might melt, but, you know, their combustion temperature and the energy required might be a lot greater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you for bringing that up, John. Yeah, Boone, you, you had mentioned that. Yeah, I didn't go into it in much detail at all, but no, John, that's a good point. That question is raised quite a bit when we go out and talk with landowners. They say, well, what about Trex decking? How does that compare to wood? Is that um, fire resistant? And it, and it is exactly what you just said. And, um, just to reiterate what you said is it, it does burn once you meet that combustion point, um, but, but it is harder to ignite initially, right? It doesn't ignite as easily as wood. And then, um, but once it does start burning, it, it burns pretty intensely. It was out with a, one of our structure departments and that's exactly what he was saying to us as well. He says, don't be fooled that it won't burn. He's like, it's harder to get burning. Right. Once it does, he says, we got to step back and it's pretty, pretty toxic stuff for us. So it's mm. a little bit scarier, but it does take quite a bit more to get it to ignite. Mm -hmm. yeah. and How much more, thing, I don't know, I'd have to look it up. Another thing I want to mention is for some folks who are considering just uh, putting on those um, uh, treatments that they can just you know paint onto their wood decks. Um, that's great, but consider how, often you're gonna to have to reapply that coating. And so if you don't wanna put that time and that money into it, then it might be worth it to just replace the materials with something that's a little more resistant. Um, yeah, and the same is true for, for roofing. I've, I've had some folks ask, oh, well, can I treat my, my roof and 
I mean, it's still a flammable material, but also, I mean, what if, you know, life catches up to you and you end up not being able to treat, uh, do the, the treatment um, that year, and then it's just more, more susceptible and it's just a, um, a lot of extra work. But I get it, you know, it still could be an alternative. Um, say, you know, you want to save up some money to replace your deck or your roof. Um, and you have a plan to do it in two years, then maybe your plan is to apply these treatments to the wood in the meantime, while you're, you know, preparing to actually do the replacement. Okay, well, uh, that's the first example. Oh, and I want to check if we had more comments. Uh, oh, yeah, what about the balcony? Thank you, Albert. Um, so uh, the balcony would be a concern, I would say, for what, once again, what kind of um, furniture, outdoor furniture you're leaving out there. Um, just like how we were talking about the outdoor furniture on this deck. And then also it's another place where um, needles and debris can accumulate. So making sure that you're doing maintenance of that balcony. Uh, yeah, if anyone had any other comments on the balcony, that's what I would say for it. Because I, I want to recognize, you know, it, it, it would be hard for us to say, okay, replace everything. <laughs> I think that's going to be really difficult for a lot of people to stomach. So I want to be realistic with this. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the comment about replacing a few boards next to the house, a few deck boards. Um, I mean, the, hopefully, I, I was thinking with that comment, it would be replacing enough deck boards that's five feet out. Um, but, you know, these are just all like little compromises. If you're really set on keeping that deck, then maybe this is something that you can do, uh, you know, replacing boards that's five feet out um, and putting in a little gravel or something like that. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a whole spectrum of how you can go, you know, to uh, the full extreme of replacing everything. Um, and then for some folks, at least they know they have options along the way if they, you know, don't want to completely remove their deck. But, you know, just, of course, still being mindful of the risks associated with it. All right. So let's go to the next uh, example. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> um, I heard that this is a, a house of, of someone who, well, someone who's in this meeting used to live in this house. So maybe they can answer whatever questions we have that we can't see uh, since we're not physically there. Um, but if we start back at the top of uh, the home assessment form, uh, you know, we're, we're starting at the top, moving our way down and then out. Um, still, you know, and, and focusing on the first zone. Uh, what do you think about this roofing material? So it looks like composite roofing material. So that is a, you know, in that non-flammable category, but, you know, we still want to take a look around and see if there's any accumulation of debris, making sure it's well-maintained, um, looking to see if there's gutters, if they're maintained, and then we could put notes of that in the home assessment form. Uh, it's really hard for us to see any kind of vents or eaves in this picture. Um, I don't know, Ed, if you have a memory of what it was like. Um, uh, it was open, yeah, open boxed eaves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so not, not ideal, especially in the combination of the vegetation and the eave arrangement together. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's something that we could note on the home assessment form um, in order to make sure that's more resistant to embers. Um, I'm thinking about those, that eighth inch mesh. Um, and then the siding, kind of hard to see, but it looks kind of like vinyl siding. Mm 
Yeah, so. Oh, and then we had a comment. Plants around the house are grown up under the eaves. Mm -hmm. so, so not only do we have um, plants under the eaves, um, but they're also very flammable, flammable plants. Um, but I first wanna make sure we're still going along with that top down and then out. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about the siding. Uh, there's no decks or fences that I can see. Okay, so now we're into zone one and thinking about that vegetation. That's um, coniferous, these evergreen shrubs um, that Ross had pointed out. And um, yeah, they're very flammable. Look, some of them are not only right under eaves, but also some of them are right next to a window. Um, and so I would definitely put a note in the home assessment form that I would recommend replacing these. Um, yeah, and, and here's more, I see more of that. Uh, is there an example of ladder fuels? Ground cover too low hanging branches or other landscaping right next to the house. So actually these shrubs here, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell, but it looks like they're really close to this tree. So imagine fire moving along on the ground and it gets to one of these uh, shrubs. And yeah, I would call this a ladder fuel. This is a way that then the fire could leap up into these trees. Um, also this shrub here too, that fire can then leap up into this tree. Whereas this tree here, which is, it actually appears that it's more outside of that first zone. It looks like it's more in that second zone, um, but still we watch out for ladder fuels in that zone. Um, this tree is nicely limbed up. So this, you know, we can at least uh, say some encouraging things for this landowner like, oh yeah, this tree looks good, but these other ones have these issues of ladder fuels. And it looks like whoever, it actually looks like someone was working on doing some maintenance. They got their ladder out and, <laughs> and a bunch of branches on the ground. Just going along with the ladder fuels and looking at those trees, I just also want to make sure we're pointing out that those trees that we're looking at there are um, deciduous trees. And generally, as a rule of thumb, deciduous trees hold moisture longer through the, um, through the season than a coniferous tree does and are a little harder <clears throat> harder to ignite or harder to torch. And then when we're thinking about removing those ladder fuels, um, usually like nine times out of 10, the first place we want to start is by <clears throat> removing those, the, the vegetation beneath them. So removing that brush and stuff. So if you were to remove that brush uh, beneath that one that is um, closest to the house, <clears throat> oh man, I should have drank, took up some water there. But uh, we would, <clears throat> if we got rid of that brush, we probably wouldn't need to worry about the limbs too much for the most part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, yeah, I think that this, uh, this right here is the, the deciduous broadleaf tree that Boone was referring to. And so I don't think it would have been as much of an issue with its branches if we didn't have these shrubs next to it. Um, and I'm not sure what this is, but yeah, think about that rule of thumb of having that space, it's, uh, whatever the understory vegetation is, multiply that by three and making sure that there's that space in between um, the tree and the shrub. So, I mean, look at this here, this, I don't know if this is a, a juniper or it could be a lodge pole. It's really grainy, can't tell, but um, look how close that this shrub is to these lower branches here. So you have the option of either removing uh, this shrub, so that's not a ladder fuel for this conifer tree, or, you know, limbing up the branches or doing both in order to create that space. Um, so, yeah, I think that that pretty much covers, but yeah, that's a good point about con difference between the conifer trees and the broadleaf trees. Um, and also making sure that they're well irrigated, that they're well, you know, they're uh, watered, because even if uh, there's a broadleaf tree or, or shrub, um, if it's dying, like the leaves are drying up or it's dead, then yeah, it's, it's going to be flammable. So <laughs> I'm sure you don't really want that look in front of your house anyway, dead, dead trees. Um, 
All right, let's uh, move on to the next example. Oh, okay, well, what do we think about this one? Anything that stands out that you would want to note in the home assessment form? Good or bad? Yeah, Ross mentioned, you guys are good at this. You mentioned the, the fence, the fence is attached to the home, but because then they're considering that the fence is part of that um, home ignition zone, they made this gravel pathway um, in that first zone and made sure that it's around the fence. And so this is an example of uh, what would be acceptable. If you have this wood fence and you want to hold on to it, um, then making sure that you remove the, uh, what could ignite it by creating this gravel pathway around it. Oh yeah, I can zoom in. <laughs> Planter nearly under the eaves. Um, so I, I guess you're, you're referring more to this these plants here? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like there might be some sage in there. Jane was mentioning. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, we would want this kind of vegetation if it is those natural, natural plants and flammable. Um, to be in the second zone, not in the first zone. Um, so at this point, it does look like it's a little bit close. I think they had, overall, I'm really impressed with the fact that they put in this um, uh, gravel pathway. So I think that's a good example. But at the same time, um, yeah, I would maybe want, I would suggest for them to have this a little further out because we don't want um, the flammable vegetation uh, within that zero to five foot zone. Oh, it, you know, and, and here I didn't even follow my own comments of starting from the top and moving our way down and then out. Well, you know, like there were things that really stood out to us, but um, look at that roof. What kind of roof material does that look like? Aren't, aren't they fiberglass shingles or something that's not flammable? Concrete tiles or something. Concrete right. tile. Yeah, at first looking, I was like, oh no, is that something? No, yeah, I think concrete tile or, or yeah, that would be um, a good non-flammable material. And uh, it looks like they do have some gutters. So making sure that they're maintaining the gutters, but also they could put that eighth inch metal mesh over the gutters as well to keep the needles out. Um, so yeah, otherwise I think this, that these uh, homeowners are onto a really good start. There are some suggestions that we just mentioned, but um, you know, at least uh, this gravel really makes a big difference. Okay, so that we had a couple of examples where we were focusing on the house itself and the yeah. uh, first zone. Yeah, did anyone else have a, a comment they wanted to add? Yep, dense patches of pine could be thin. So that's a little further out. Now we're talking more about, you know, the second zone and the third zone. Um, so yeah, this actually could be an example, a good example for our next uh, zone talking about um, uh, how this is a little bit thick that they would probably want to disrupt that continuous fuel and ladder fuels. Um, that are more um, outside of that first zone from the home. Yeah, good point, Jean. All right. Okay, so Matt, we already started talking about zone two, property protection zone. Uh, so let's look at our first example here. So what do we think about oh. these trees? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it's, it, it's very interesting because now that you go through this workshop and I know maybe this part sounds, seems tedious, but you'll never look at a home or landscaping the same way ever again. You know, you can't help it. I drive through neighborhoods and I, these things just stand out to me now when they didn't before. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, I would say that then this is the second zone, five to 30 feet. Um, does anyone have any suggestions for what they would do? <laughs> Cut them down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> what was that, Jane? Oh, take these down, plant wildflowers, nice low growing <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they could choose to maybe leave one of these um, and limit up a little bit, but they are pretty small, you know, trees at this point. Um, but they, I think the biggest thing to me is that they look dry and, and dead and, <laughs> or dying. And um, yeah, I would want to, I mean, think about if this thing were to catch fire, you would have some considerable flame lengths and flame height. Um, and so, yeah, it would be good to disrupt some of that fuel, uh, removing some of this. And, and also I would suggest, I mean, it's, it's tough, uh, but I think in that second zone, it's really good to have things well irrigated, mm -hmm. especially in, in the landscape that we live in. Okay. All right. How about this example for that? five to 30 foot zone. Is it scary? Not scary? Scary. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, this is, it's very common, you know? Um, we see this a lot. And so I, that's why it's really, really good, really important to take a good look around that zone um, we'll and think about what you could do. They plant them for good reasons because they want the shade or they want the screening and you know you can't just chop them down and meet their other requirements it's really tough. Right exactly it, you know there's uh, definitely some compromises that would need to be made. Um, I agree that the shading is, is important because the shading also does help to retain some of that soil moisture but also I would argue if you have a lot of vegetation then they're all like straws. They're, they're taking up all of the water at the same time. And then they're all competing with each other too. So you're more likely to get one of these trees dying because they're competing with each other for water and resources. So you really give them also a better chance at being healthy if you can separate them out a bit and then reduce some of those fuels. Um, so, you know. Yeah. So are you talking about thinning it out and maybe laddering some up? Say that again, Gregory? Are, are you saying maybe thin, thinning some of this out and then laddering some of them, those that you keep up, probably? Yes. 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 <laughs> At some point. Yeah. So more specifically, um, the goal that I would suggest would be to have these a little more because we're in that second zone um have greater space between these trees and these shrubs and then also focusing on what trees you do leave to have them limbed up any other thoughts on this zone yeah i would also watch out for invasive grasses too i mean that's you know they're really hard to control but um, because they can really be a carrier of fire, uh, fire spread, um, that, you know, taking a look around that zone, around your home, um, to see if you've got any of that invasive grass issue coming in and managing for it. Susan mentioned that the slope was scary, and I agree. I think one of the things to be aware of is that when you have a slope, you want to take your distance out a little further. Um, because fire tends to burn up and it, it has winds that form that way and it'll push it all up. Um, so, yeah, Susan, that's a great point. And Jane, that's a great point um, that 
uh, with the um, with slope, uh, it ends up actually uh, accelerating fire spread because uh, it preheats the fuels that's ahead of it. Any, any of the fuel that's upslope will be preheated and fire ends up moving faster through it. Mm. So if you live on top of a hill, this is something to consider and you could actually extend your zones that you treat, that you reduce your fuels out further than um, the recommendation. So really what we went over, that should be like the minimum uh, recommendations in terms of width, like in terms of uh, distance out from your home. But uh, if you live on a slope or at the top of a hill, I would recommend um, pushing those zones out even further um, to do that fuel reduction. So I'm, I'm very happy you brought that up. That's a good point. All right, let's uh, move to the next example. Uh, all right, for that five to 30 foot zone, zone two, what do you think here? <laughs> Anything that stands out? Boone, what did you have in mind for this one? <laughs> Just wanted to uh, throw an extra one out there. You know, so I tried to get a mix in here of ones that we, um, that also showed, you know, some of the better, uh, no ladder fuels in that five to 30. And then also mm -hmm. I think, you know, I was also kind of thinking about that zero to five, not that we needed to revisit it in this one, but I fear that if I put this one in there, it would get people to kind of rethink about that zero to five, what that deck looks like. Um, and then some of the ladder fuels that people have worked on around that home. <clears throat> but I think the bigger one in this picture is just, I wanted to show a different change of, instead of looking at terrible things that maybe we could see some of the better things that we, in, the, in the picture. Right. Right, I know I can't help it, but when I look at this picture, I'm focusing on that zero to five foot zone because uh, these uh, evergreen trees here definitely seem like they could be an issue if, uh, you know, lat as ladder fuels and they get up and then look at how they're right next to the deck and that could ignite the deck. But uh, I really want us to focus on more of this um, second zone, the five to 30 foot. And so really it doesn't look like um, it's uh, too bad in this five to 30 foot zone, at least on this side of the house. Um, one thing they could do to really increase the uh, flame resistance. Um, I mean, well, it's, it doesn't even, there's really not much um, flammable material that would carry fire in this part of the yard. Um, but if there was more grass, it's kind of hard to see whether there's gravel in there or grass, but um, say this was all dry grass or tall grass, then you'd want to focus on maintaining it, mowing it, making sure it's watered. Um, but otherwise, there's really not much to carry fire if you're just looking in this section. So it's really great to, when, you know, giving people suggestions, also letting them know, okay, at least this part here looks good. Um, you know, uh, giving some encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to zone three. Okay. All right, think about zone three, that's 30 to 100 feet out. What do we think here? Okay. All right, so I, I'm actually gonna speed up a little bit because I think we're getting a little short on time. I thought we had a lot of extra time. Um, so I would say in this zone, um, it looks actually pretty good. I would just want them 
to think about, you know, this vegetation in the back here and the fence because the fence is, you know, uh, it's still connected, but otherwise um, further out looks pretty good. And this is a really large tree, so it doesn't have any of those lower limbs that we're concerned about. But yeah, I just focus on this vegetation back here and looking at the back side of the house. Um, and then here, uh, yep, it looks like there would be a lot to work on in this third zone. Um, breaking up that field continuity, I would maybe leave more patches of these native shrubs, but making sure that there's more space around them um, in order to prevent the, that fire, slow down that fire spread and lower the fire intensity if fire were to ever show up here. Um, and uh, yep, also thinking about um, doing any kind of maintenance outside that area. Okay, oh, whoops, we went back, hold on. Let's go into this last example. Sorry, I hope that didn't make anyone dizzy. Um, here, yeah, in that, that third zone, it looks like there's good, well-irrigated grass. Um, and really this actually looks like a pretty good example um, that we would like to model for our homes. And it looks like in the background, these trees have been limbed up and are a bit more spaced. Um, can't really tell on this back side. Maybe there's something to look at there, but at least for this foreground, it looks pretty good. All right. Well, I think everyone got the idea. <laughs> so um, I'm going to turn it back over to Boone to wrap up um, our program for today. Cool. Thank you, Ariel, for that. Um, yeah, and I didn't mean to rush at the end, but I just kind of want to get in a time check real quick here where we at, we're at. And it was uh, appropriate, right? We, you know, when we talk about those three zones, it's like um, we started off to talk today. It's that zero to five that ends up being one of the most critical pieces because it's the final disconnect between our home. It's like what, what ember or what receptive fuel beds do we have directly on or around the home? And then what is that connection from our home out to that wildland? So um, having a... Um, a, a little more time spent talking about those things is, is quite appropriate. Um, I'm going to share one last slide here. Um, so today we, we've gone through quite the, um, the long trip here, right? We, we started off with kind of fire context, talking about living in a fire ecosystem. And, and you know, and I, I don't remember if the phrase was directly said, but it is quite true that it's not a matter of if, but when a fire happens to us and it's all about how we prepare for it and when that fire does happen um, to us or in our landscape and it directly impacts us we want to be as prepared as we can and we want to we want to know and have the confidence that we did all that we can and we took care of our piece of that puzzle so so we went through the wildland urban interface talked about how the fire actually is spreading so some of that fire science and then Ed dug deep into those three zones and described kind of what we should be thinking through those. We looked at some building materials. And then we came around to the home assessments, which was some of those resources that were sent out to you in an email. There's a form in there that's nice that kind of follows along to um, look at doing home assessments for yourself, helping your neighbors or your HOA or however the situation may be for you. But we dove in quite quite deep on those home assessments and looking at those pictures. And that's where it all comes together, which is awesome that we did that and we're able to spend the time on it. Um, ironically, what I thought was kind of funny is chuckling to myself. Um, I put those pictures together. And when I was putting those pictures together, when you go through the neighborhoods uh, within Deschutes County or just about any, any place, it seems that you, you can always find examples of that extended zone of 30 to 100 feet that need work. However, in most of my pictures that I have on file, I took mostly pictures of places that people have done the work because I wanted to show the good examples. So I, I had a hard time finding bad examples in the 30 to 100 feet, even though they're, they're right out my window almost, almost quite literally. Not, not they aren't, but they, just down the road they are. So first, thank you everybody for making the time to do this. You know, this happened right in the middle of the week and it's a big block of time. So I know that's not an easy time commitment for folks to do. You know, we had um, a good amount of people that had signed up, but I, I do understand people sign up and don't make it. And for those of you that were able to 
fit it in your plan and, and into your day, I totally appreciate it. Because the more we can share and the more we're able to help folks out with preparing, the better we all are, right? It's a, all about the aggregate effect of all of us. Um, this slide here is uh, all of our contact info if you need to contact us. Um, I think you probably have it all through the emails that we've already been sending back and forth. But there are other programs out there that we're um, that we do participate in and that we do administer like the firewise site usa so if you're interested in that stuff you can check out some of those links that i have that i sent out in that email or email us directly and we can help you going on in that direction lots of folks to do individual home assessments you know and I, I encourage folks to um you can reach out to myself but also your local fire department is also a great resource and they see things that that i don't when it comes to fire and general emergency management planning so things like uh, ambulance access and stuff, but they're a great resource and we wanna make sure that we're reaching across all of our partners to um, get participation in all of those realms. Um, but with that, I think, I think that's everything we got. Um, open up for Ed or Ariel to add anything as we say goodbye. No, that's great. I really appreciate everyone's uh, interest and participation and please share this information, share that home assessment form and uh, reach out if you have any other questions. I just also echo my thanks for your time today. Uh, it's people like you out in the communities that are really gonna make the difference in uh, fire outcomes in our future. And if you have any suggestions for us, we will be doing this class in the future. So we're, we're completely open to suggestions of, of any kind of changes that you would, um, for additional uh, information that you were looking for that you didn't see today. So thanks, thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everyone.